and welcome to another edition of Proselytize or Apostatize. I'm your host, Dave Russell, and I'm waiting for my co-host, David Paulman. But I am starting an open mic night tonight with all of our guests, whoever wants to come on and talk about anything they want. Uh, it's kind of like the kickoff to this uh, whole thing on open uh, or on the apologetic month. You know, we have great debates, discussions, interviews coming up. Uh, we got Jay Warner Wallace on the first, Gary Habermas on the sixth, Fuzz Rano on the 19th. And we've got a whole bunch of guest host debates as well. So uh, as we get started today, if there's anybody that wants to come in now, they're more than welcome. Uh, ask us any question you want. Uh, we could talk about whether the sky is blue or uh, it, anything that you want. And, and that's what uh, we're trying to, to figure out here. David Palman is just uh, telling me he's here on Facebook. I don't know if he's actually able to get in yet or not. But if anybody wants to uh, come in, uh, I'll send an evite. I am actually putting one out there now. And I'm used to having David Palman on the line with me. So, but he's not here yet. So, yeah, it's just like a presuppositionless to, uh, you know, be late on things, you know, and heretics, you know. So, but yeah, if anybody wants to come on again, we are here. Uh, I wanted to talk about epistemology first uh, with David, but since he's not here, I'm going to start with apologetics because I think it's important that. Uh, we talk a little bit about apologetics. That's what we do here on uh, Proselytize or Apostatize. We talk about everything under the sun when it comes to apologetics. The goal of this show is is to uh, facilitate the discussion, the hard discussions, the long discussions, and to really be here for the people that may be even on the fence and give them good information. And uh, as I say, to engage some and to... Uh, <laughs> David says, I'm making you do all the thinking. Here he is. If anybody wants to see what David Palman's writing, there we go, right there. He is here, but he's not. But as I was saying, uh, we, we exist to engage and to equip. It's kind of like my motto, you know, to engage some and to equip some. The engagement is with anybody that's like, an atheist or of another religion of a different worldview. And we even gone and straight out and did politics a couple times on some social issues when my former co-host was here, Titus. But yeah, that's really why we exist. And we wanted to open this up tonight for any of our um, guests or fans that want to come on and all they got to do is click the, uh, the stream yard. And I'll be putting this out here as uh um, as, as we go. So uh, David Paulman saying he's with us in spirit here. And there's the link. If you guys want to go and click on that to come in and chat, it's fine with me. Uh, David says he's with us in spirit. So David, you said apologetics is epistemology, buddy. What did you mean by that? Can you tell everybody why apologetics is epistemology? Um, and by the way, hurry up and get on. <laughs> yeah, we're just waiting for Paulman to decide to show up. So He says he's going as fast as he can too. So, but yeah, the uh, the idea that you know churches need apologetics is is pretty tantamount right now. I think that we have to have apologetics in the churches these days because of the type of culture we live in. So, without that, I mean, without it, I, I don't think we're gonna be able to get where we need to be. And I know I'm supposed to be doing all the thing. I'm not supposed to be doing all the thinking here, but I think it's important because these type of conversations help us. They help us, uh, you know, they help us reach out to people. They help us uh, actually engage on an intellectual level. R.C. Sproul said he was he was disturbed by the the credibility of uh, the intellectual 
uh, Christ, you know, intellectual Christianity. He was troubled by where that was. And it's true. I mean, we have issues when it comes to apologetics, even in the church, because, you know, there's so many people that have come out and said, hey, you know, I don't I don't know why I believe what I believe. And the answers I'm getting from my pastors aren't sufficient. So, again, another reason why this broadcast exists is to be able to give those hard answers and to help those hard answers. But as I keep trying, I'm going to keep trying to get David Paulman in here. Uh, you guys can come on or ask questions. It is all good with me. I'm here for you guys tonight. Again, if you want to come in, just hit the uh, StreamYard link. Have a good uh, a good Chrome connection or updated Chrome and a good connection, and you should be on as soon as you hit my uh, quite here. Pullman says apologetics is epistemology. But again, I asked him, what does he mean by that? Oh, he says his computer is being slow right now. David Palmer wants to know how old the Earth is. Well, David, uh, I would say about 4.5 to 4.6 billion years, give or take. Um, at least that's what modern science tells us. Uh, I think the question you're, you're trying to get at is, is trying to go to these young Earth creationists and see what they got to say. Um, but yeah. I would say uh, I'm an old earther, so old earth creation is is kind of where I'm at. Uh, I take uh, on the the RTB model pretty seriously. Uh, I think that's the the best description of the earth and how old the earth is, and I think their model for creation is is pretty legit. So I would say that definitely. David Palman, you said you got a new computer. I don't know, understand how it's so slow if you just got a new computer. And the reason I had to start the broadcast, David, is because I couldn't wait because Facebook Live doesn't like you to go uh, too long on that. But yeah, to answer your question, the Earth is 4.6 billion years. Or yeah, 4.6 billion. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, let's see here. Did I polish that mic? <laughs> no, that's the way it came, man. I don't even touch it when I'm not even doing anything. I push it off to the side and and able to do my schoolwork here as well. So I know, I know you're Titus. Uh, you, you've got the, the account. So obviously, oh, look who it is. Look who decided the show. There he <laughs> is. Hey buddy. The, uh, computer wasn't working. So I switched over to phone for however long it lasts. Yeah, David, you had me stuttering and stammering here the first 10 minutes of the show. Thanks a lot, man. Thanks a lot, man. Uh, this show would be nothing without me. I mean, this proves it to me, man. I mean, you just you can't you can't handle yeah. these kinds of hard questions on your own. Oh, I definitely oh, I can. Definitely I'm can. just uh, uh, well, I don't know. I can hear myself through your computer, so it's really distracting as well. So you're gonna have to mute something there. Hmm. Better. Better. Nope. 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 I can still hear myself. I can still hear myself. I tried it with earbuds, without earbuds, and it didn't help anything. Hmm. Titus says, how can he Titus lose control of, this account? control of this account? Well, you can't, Titus. Well, you You're, can't, stuck Titus. You're stuck to it for life. All right. We got a question right, from a question Sahai from Luke. Sahai I hope I said that right, buddy. That right, buddy. Do you agree with scholars that the Prophet Muhammad... Is a great example in all his ways, sayings, and doings. Well, Mr. Luke, if you listen to the broadcast, we do not agree with all the scholars because I don't think all the scholars say that. So, yeah. yeah. 
I'd like to know what source uh, you got this yeah. idea from that all scholars say that because uh, I'm aware of at least one. Uh, well, we'll see if David Wood counts as a scholar. He, he, he's he got a PhD. Yeah. Um, so that makes him a scholar of some sort. And he certainly would not agree with that statement. Yeah, David, there is still an David, echo, I still I heard. An echo I heard. I think it's on your end. I don't know. I mean, I can is mute when I'm not muted? talking. Is your computer muted? I'm not on my computer. My computer's not working, so I'm on my phone. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, yeah. so how do you, how do you, uh, how do you, uh, let me see if I can, if I can minimize it. You still hear me? All right, now you can talk. Go ahead. Is the echo gone, Titus? Luke says, it was a joke, and I was pulling your leg before Brother David, <laughs> Davis Paulman hope, hopped on. <laughs> I'm a Christian. Awesome, dude. But, yeah, uh, it would be good to see those scholars if you had them. But, again, yes, we get you. We get you just joking. Um. Yeah. Do we still have an echo, Titus? All right, here's another question. <laughs> Paulman, are you a pacifist yet? Nope, not yet. <laughs> All right. Um so yeah, Titus, I did speak a little bit about you as as this broadcast started. So yeah, none of us are pass pacifists uh, at all, except for you. So, but yeah, we'll have to debate on that sometime uh, coming up. <sighs> See why you're still a pacifist after all all the uh, you know after we've disproved you several times. <laughs> he said shame. <laughs> Uh, again, if anybody wants to come on, uh, just feel free. You can actually use this link to get on, and you can actually come on with video as well. You don't have to uh, uh, type like Titus is doing. He can actually come on if he wants and talk about pacifism if he's if he's okay with doing that. That's fine. No, you got to say if he's man enough. You got to like talk oh, him yeah. with it to make him yeah, come on. him a little bit. Yeah. But if anybody wants to come on, I got a 10 person quay. So if anybody wants to come on and wait a turn to actually come on and talk, we'll get you on here and we'll actually put as many people as we can on here and have a big discussion. So uh, it can go any way, any way. David, uh, you were talking about epistemology. You know, apologetics is epistemology. Why don't you uh, explain Why don't that? You, uh, explain that? Well, sure. So this kind of comes out of a bit of an article that I'm working on uh, called A Dilemma for Presuppositionalism. And so what I identify in um, this article is that apologetics is tightly connected to epistemology because both are concerned with the justification of belief, right? So we could really say that um, your apologetic methodology is going to be kind of an extension of the epistemology that you hold. And so whatever form of epistemology that you hold to... Uh, that's going to have a big effect on how you uh, try to justify your Christian faith. And so, you know, that can play out in a lot of different ways, right? If you hold an evidentialist epistemology, then you'll very likely have a classical or evidential apologetic methodology. Uh, if you're some sort of coherentist, then you might well hold to some sort of presuppositional apologetics. So, uh, yeah, so just um, that's, that's the connection between the two. Uh, it's, it's about justification. Yeah, it, I, I, that's what I've learned. It's a lot about justification. So we got our first contestant here on the mic is right. Uh, <laughs> uh, Titus, I'm going to add him to the stream. What's up, buddy? Hey, hey, how are you, David's doing? We're doing good. I thought I would try this open mic night thing to, uh, you know, have a little fun with it. So what's up? What's going on? Not much. I was just scrolling Facebook and, and saw it pop up. I, I saw you were going to do it earlier, but I didn't remember that it was tonight. So I'm glad I happened to be in the right place at the right time. Yeah, buddy. We've got uh, we've got a full month. So I decided to, hey, let's kick it off with open mic night, you know, and, and see how that how that turns out, you know. Yeah, I saw you're rolling with the big dogs this month. 
Oh yeah, we've got we've got three big guests: Jay Warner Wallace, uh, Gary Habermas, and Fuzz Rana from Reasons to Believe. Nice. So you're still also. I also got. I actually had to put a calendar next to uh, next to my desk here to write out this month's stuff because we've got so much. I, we've got uh, uh, David and or uh, uh, David and myself versus. Uh, jared and um jordan coming on nice. uh, it's more of like a discussion i i think so they are they are your nemesis aren't they like <laughs> since proselytize or apostatize started jordan has been kind of like the arch enemy atheist and now they started their own show um i see that you guys interact a lot so that's pretty cool yeah yeah you know i, I want to look at him as a nemesis and, <laughs> and more 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 like you know He's, he's part of the family, you know, I mean, he's part there of the PRA go. family, you know, and, uh, so, you know, Jared is too. And these guys are just great to talk to. They, they have meaningful discussions and they're always polite and they're always, uh, um, you know, respectful. So it's good to have those type of discussions because I think it really, uh, adds to the content of the show and what we're trying to do is say, Hey, look, we can come and we can reason together, you know, and yeah. we can talk about these things together. But yeah, so you wanted to jump on to talk about passivism. Yes, let's do it. I'm always down for that. All right, man. Um, give an opening statement. You got five minutes. Go. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, Ty if no, no, nobody knows, Titus is a pacifist. And we've had actually, I would refer you to the show. We actually had Titus on before he uh, debated uh, Doug Wilson. And just to kind of like give him some pushback and, and you know, go – you know, so he could prepare a little bit, but not like he needed it. He's pretty good on his own. So, uh, anyways, Titus, tell us why your Mennonite background leads you to be a pacifist. <laughs> it's the Bible, not my Mennonite background. I would, uh, <laughs> oh, you sure about that? Well, of, of course, our, yeah. our background always influences us, but there's a number of things about my extremely conservative Mennonite background that I'm sure would put you guys' evangelical fundamentalism to shame that I have thrown by the wayside but pacifism is definitely one of the things that i've kept um but it, it really starts with love your enemies that's my ultimate proof text and I, I think it really comes down to your view of love so if love is simply an inward disposition that doesn't affect your actions i can see how you could love your enemy and kill them simultaneously but if it is more than an inward disposition, but actually affects how we treat our enemy, then I think that would preclude killing them for two reasons. Number one, it cuts off their opportun opportunity to repent if they are not a believer. If they are a believer, they're probably not doing something worthy of death. Um, and and if, they're, if they are a believer, also, it, it really is not showing the the love that is supposed to exist between the the family of God for one person to kill another. Um, but also, no, it doesn't just cut off their opportunity to repent, but it also ends their physical life on earth, you know, obviously. Um, so, yeah, just it, uh, the, the list of, of things that people actually want in life, um, it, you know, death is generally pretty near the bottom. And if love is seeking the well-being of that person, I'm not sure how killing them contributes to their well-being. Yeah, I, I think you're right. It does have to do a lot with your view on love. I'd have to disagree with the uh, with that conclusion of well-being. I, I think that's just part of it. There's a lot to love that I think that we'd have to explore before we can say, hey, you know, because it could be the love that I have for somebody that uh, drives me to be violent uh, towards somebody else to protect them. So that's always a factor. Uh, I hear David's in the background, so I'm going to let, let him respond here because I see him. Oh, well, I was going to say, come on, Titus. Haven't you read Romans 13? I mean, you know, we got to obey those that have the rule over us. We got to, uh, you know, the, the rulers that be are ordained of God. Uh, if you're resisting the power, then you're resisting God. So if the, if the powers tell you you got to fight in a war and kill people, I mean, you got to do it, man. Romans 13 it's right there, man. I feel like you're being sarcastic, or I hope so. But I, I do want to respond to what Russell said. So I agree. You you can kill your enemy out of love for your neighbor, um, but you cannot kill your enemy out of love for your enemy. So we're not just called to love our neighbor. 
we're also called to love our enemy. Um, yep. So we're in a paradox, right? Like, how do we how do we solve that? Well, I think there's ways that you can love your neighbor when they're being violently attacked, for example, that do not include killing their attacker. I, I just think it it requires a little bit of creativity. Um, <laughs> often, often these things are set up as a false binary where either you kill the attacker or you do nothing. Um, and I just think there's more options than that. Like Anabaptists have this concept of the third way that there's there's always going to be a way that that does not fit into the binary that's presented that's actually the way of Jesus and that that's the creative way and and that's what I would encourage people to pursue yeah so i mean okay for example okay for example uh david your 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 stuff's not muted i could still i can hear myself again yeah i don't know what's going on with your your sound there buddy <laughs> um but yeah so titus like in my position, if I come after somebody, I'm not to come at them with killing them in, in, in mind. It's it's to stop the threat. And I, I think that you would also agree that, okay, yeah, we got to stop the threat. You want to see more creative ways to do it. But you do agree that if somebody's attacking your neighbor uh, and you intervene and it's violent, you know, you just do your best to, hey, I'm not going to try to kill you, but I am going to try to stop you. Yeah, so th there are different responses that are appropriate in different situations. So if someone came up and slapped me on the left cheek, obviously the appropriate response is to turn the other cheek. But if someone's beating up your neighbor, there's going to be a different response to that. Right. Um, it, the response might be to restrain the attacker. Um, the response might be to put yourself in between the attacker and the victim, which is a very Christian response if we look at what Jesus did depending on your model of atonement um, or, or, you know, there, the, the right response might be to call the police. Um, so there, there are a number of appropriate responses. My only contention is that and ending the life of the attacker is never the appropriate response. And generally the posture that conservative Christians have toward the attacker is also inappropriate. This like, like we want to, teach them a lesson, you know, rather than trying to figure out the way that is, is the most redeeming, um, not just for the victim, but also for the attacker. All right, Paul, when you got anything? Well, I was going to ask if we have anyone else waiting, but uh, if we don't, no, we don't have I'll... anybody yet. No, I'm going okay, to good. take you all night. No, it's fine. <laughs> chat, chat. It's okay. The old hosts, uh, or the, the hosts, uh, combined here. <laughs> So yeah, I was I was listening to a, a sermon by Greg Boyd, uh, as I want to do, and he was you know kind of making these sorts of arguments that you're making because you know he's a pacifist, and um, he gave something that I found helpful but also kind of vague, and it it seems to me like Christian pacifists really give these vague answers that aren't helpful in specific situations. So maybe you know you can help me with this, but um, what he said was. That if uh, he says if you if you really love your enemies right then um, think of them like if it was your son right if you had your own son and he was the person who broke into your house and wanted to hurt your family well then how would you handle that situation and so he said uh, you would think of some way to deal with that other than you know killing him so he says you know uh, if if you want to think of how you know, to love your enemies, then uh, if someone, you know, who you might otherwise be tempted to hurt, think of if that was someone I loved, then how would I deal with that? But that wasn't like a specific answer. That was just, um, you know, uh, a helpful way of thinking about it, but without, you know, really dealing with the situation. So um, yeah. how would you kind of say we could get more specific with this? So you're setting up a hypothetical situation where a thief comes into my house with a gun to steal what I have? Yeah, or, uh, you know, anything like that. Is it just it always seems like we're looking for a third way or, oh, well, I would think of it this way. But just never, never, I, I never really hear like specifics on how it would actually play out. It's just like kind of thrown to this hypothetical third way and we never really hear what it is. Sure. So, well, I, I would need you to be pretty specific with this hypothetical situation, but let's maybe I can set it up um, for you. So suppose he, someone came in with a gun um, and he's pointing it at me and my family and telling me to give all my money. 
I'm going to give him all my money and, and ask him to leave. Right. I'm not going to, I'm not going to try to shoot him or take him down because that would put me and my family even more at risk. So I'm not, I'm not quite sure. Maybe you have a different situation in mind. Uh, I mean, it, it could be that when, you know, they've got a specific demand like that, that could be easier, but um, you know, maybe, maybe there'd be a more difficult one. Uh, and I'm trying to think of a specific one that I've heard of. Well, um, I mean, we can, we can go to, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of the night stalker. No. Okay. He was a 19, he was in the eighties. He was a serial killer and he would go to random houses uh, saying he was uh, working for Satan and he would, uh, do all sorts of things to people and kill them. It doesn't matter if you're young, you're old, but his intent, he was a sociopath. His intent was to take the life of people. Now, in a situation where he has a knife and you have a gun and you have the ability to stop him, to stop his reign of terror, I mean, do you take that opportunity to stop the threat, not necessarily in the hopes to kill him, now, blood loss yep. is what actually kills people, right? So that's <laughs> that's what stops people verbatim, right? But yes, we take actions to aid that along. So I, I don't understand where, uh, as a pacifist, where that that line is drawn for you. Like you're not actually killing the person. Your actions are. And if you're dealing with somebody like Ramirez, who was the Night Stalker, and you ha you're at that point. You have no no choice but to to shoot. And you know you're you're hitting center mass. You're not going for the head. You're not going to John Wick him. You know two shots to the chest, one to the head. But uh, you're gonna you're gonna um, stop the threat. And let's say once you do stop the threat, Ramirez is laid out. Now my next my next response is to give him first aid. To try to keep him alive, yeah. so he can face justice the right way. Now, would that be an appropriate response if it came to that? So, uh, let me try to set up your situation a little more. He, I, I know who the guy is. I recognize him as this creep, and my wife is across the the room, um, and he is headed for her. I just so happened to be in the part of my house where my hunting rifle was in. A closet and uh, th this is becoming less and less likely but I'm, I'm just doing this to show you how these situations are often pretty unrealistic but i just so happen to be very near my hunting rifle and somehow i'm able to grab my hunting rifle flip it up to my shoulder take it off safety it's loaded um and and shoot at him before he gets to my wife so for one i have a pretty big house so i'm already disobeying jesus teachings on wealth i'd have to have a mansion for him to, to have to run that far to get here with his knife. But if I'm that fast, um, because I, I don't encourage Christians to like carry a weapon on their person, for example, but if I'm that fast with my hunting rifle, I would assume I'm, I'm pretty good. So I, I would shoot at his legs rather than at his torso in, in hopes of toppling him, right? Um, yeah. That I, I, I don't really have a problem with, with doing something like that. That situation is so extremely rare that like if if i could get even if even if you would say you would kill the person in that situation or shoot him in the torso if i could get christians to that point i would feel like i i've succeeded in 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 what i mean by that is to say that only in that situation is it appropriate like what i well, don't yeah what well, I don't you know I, titus I'll be, can i can i interrupt real quick sure or okay cuz cuz you know you, you do make it sound like it, it's an impossible scenario or or it's less likely yes they are th these type of situations are the unlikely situations you know uh -huh. they are the un unlikely ones so yeah they they are rare and it's a shame that people get away with hurting people more than good people are able to stop them i agree with that um but let's say you know I just wanted to, and you've already pretty much answered it, but it's not uncommon. Let's say you were coming home from hunting, getting food for your, your wife, you know, and you're actually, you got your conies in your hand, you know, and you walk through the door and that's where you find it. Those situations do happen. And like well, you said, I, I think, yeah, it's, it's better to, to try at least to, to stop him and, you know, not, you're not trying to kill him. You're trying to just stop the threat, stop, trying to kill my wife, you know? So I think that's where we agree. So yeah, it, I think that should be the, the, 
the object of most Christians mindsets when it comes to that is like, yeah. you're not trying to kill the person. You're just let trying to stop you, the threat. Let anyway. me leave you with one last thing. I need to go. Dinner's ready. Um, okay. But, um, so, so a real life situation, two real life situations would be the nickel mines school shooting where the Amish school was shot up. And, and then the situation more recently, I think it was in Texas where, um, there was a shooter in a church and a uh, church member pulled a handgun out and, and took him down like very quickly. Um, yeah. So wh which of those situations, I'm, I'm just setting this up. I'm not sure if you're familiar with nickel mines, but basically a lot of Amish kids were killed and it was all over the news. And eventually like the Amish community publicly reached out and said that they forgave the shooter offered to, um, try to get get him out of his sentence i don't know what all they did but they publicly extended forgiveness and it made basically world news that that these christians were loving their enemy and forgiving the attacker like this um i would just say like which of those situations looks more like jesus which of them looks more like um a sheep going to the slaughter which is biblically how jesus is, re is referred to and we're also supposed to be as harmless as doves like is it the person who happens to be a really good shot and can whip out a gun and take down the attacker just in time? Or is it the community that, yes, suffers, follows the bloodstained footprints of the master in suffering horrible loss, but then extends love to their attackers? Um, and, and my only, con con uh, the only thing I'm trying to contest is that one of those looks more like the Christianity of Jesus and the apostles who counted it all joy to suffer. And one of it looks more like an evangelical, um, American Christianity that I would say in many ways has deviated from um, historic Christianity before Constantine. So there's my closing statement. Okay, no, that's fine. We'll, we'll answer it. David, go ahead. I'll let you go first, bud. Oh, well, he's just leaving because he's, you know, too much heat. I'm kidding. <laughs> I respect your position, favorite. Titus. <laughs> Thanks, guys. This is What's fun. that? I'm going to go eat steak. Yep. Take care, bud. All right. <laughs> Have fun. So, See, yeah, I, I, guess go I, would, vegan? I guess I would answer that uh, with the idea of, you know, I think they're both actually uh, showing the love for other people by stopping a threat like that. There, there's honor in that. I don't I don't think I would appeal to Titus's idea of the lamb to the slaughter in every situation. And I don't think that's what Christ was trying to promote. Um, he said also to be wise as, uh, as serpents, too. So, you know, there's wisdom there. Um, there's wisdom in defending yourself, I think, uh, to be able to continue, uh, your work and so forth. There's also, uh, you know, there's several different factors that, that could play into that. Uh, I do think offering forgiveness should be the next step. Absolutely. I mean, they did suffer loss and they should offer forgiveness. David, what do you think? They did suffer loss. You got yeah, anything? Yeah. Um, that? No, I mean, I agree with that. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm still conflicted on the position. I, I was going to say, I wonder why he hasn't gone vegan, though. He's going to eat that steak. Or he's okay with violence to animals. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, but, yeah, so let's let's get back to uh, epistemology. I was I was talking to uh, David Johnson today on, on epistemology, but I'm not going to give any – details because you know that's kind of uh uh you know i don't want to do that so uh, it's that's the other show but epistemology was, it was neat you know just listening to a lot when it comes to epistemology uh and the history of it and looking at you know the the three different ways to respond to skepticism which i i think we focus on a lot but we don't really don't really look too much into people like harry putnam and their semantic idea of uh, meaning and so forth. So, I mean, people like him say skepticism is, is very self-destructive. David, are you familiar with any of those? Yeah, I mean, I don't take Putnam's uh, route because he kind of has some externalist leanings and things, which I'm I'm not a fan of. But um, Why don't you explain uh, the there's a... Explain the sure, there. so... Um, I'm I'm not sure which three you're thinking of, but um the kind of the, the broad responses are you've got uh the foundationalist response, which kind of says we've got immediately justified beliefs. 
uh, usually identified kind of as our perceptions and simple analytic truths, uh, things like logical laws and stuff. Uh, these things are justified just in virtue of uh, their meanings. Uh, and then, of course, like a perception, just something that I uh, see or am aware of. Sometimes the skeptic will say, oh, well, you know, you're begging the question. You're you're assuming that, um, you know, what you see is really there. And of course, no, we're not. We know that we see something, uh, but we're not assuming it's really there. So we're not begging the question. Uh, then another uh, response is kind of the externalist one, which is just uh, that, oh, I don't have to give a response to skepticism. Right. As long as my uh, cognitive faculties are functioning properly, then, um, you know, I, I, I'm good. I don't need to give any further response beyond that. And so, uh, I'm not sure what the third. Go ahead. Oh, no, no. Go ahead. You're finishing the third. What? I, was, I wasn't sure what the third one you were thinking of was. So I was actually going to turn it over to you. Uh, OK. OK. Well, you know, I was looking at, uh, you know, they have the Cartesian. The Russellonian and the and the more these how you respond the three ways to to respond to skepticism. Uh, I think Putnam said something really cool. I got something here for it. He said it's all about meaning. To undermine knowledge, the skeptic needs to use meaningful language to describe a scenario that might be reality. Uh, I thought that was pretty cool. I think that see here's when it comes to epistemology for me. You know, I take a little bit from each of those views. I don't know if you've, have you ever heard of the eschatological uh, epistemology that Lewis promoted? C.S. Lewis? You're muted, buddy. You're muted. You're muted. My bad. It's all good, no, buddy. I'm familiar with uh, C.I. Lewis, but not, uh, not C.S. Lewis's epistemology. So I was listening to this great uh, discussion about C.S. Lewis's epistemology and how it's reflective in his in his uh, many writings. It's not just, uh, I guess, laid out. It's actually dispersed, and you can glean the epistemology not only from his apologetics and philosophy works, but his his uh, um, uh, what is it, uh, fictional works, right? So one the thing that they they talked about was is called eschatological. Epistemology. Sorry, those those words are hard to say together. <laughs> but basically, what he does is he gives like an outline of what that is, and he puts it as like the summons of love. But the the there's an into an end goal for knowledge. Like there's an there's a, a you know like a I don't want to say a teleos, but there is this idea that you know. It's built in there. It's built in, you know, into that calling. You know, it's it starts with like some sort of calling that you have, you know. And I thought it was really interesting the way they're talking about it. Uh, so if anybody wants to look up things on epistemology, I would suggest looking into uh, that and getting a more better grasp on it. Like I said, I, I just dived into it just a little bit, but I thought it was very interesting. That was one of the, the things I thought was really interesting. Let me see if I can find you something real quick on it but good david you could talk. talk yeah i mean i'm familiar with moore's refutation of skepticism moore basically oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. would just hold up his hands and say oh you know here i got two hands so uh, i know that skepticism yeah. you're ridiculous <laughs> for doubting for yeah. doubting yeah yeah uh, i i would of course fight, you know fight. that my, my response to moore is just you know, that it's, it's begging the question because that's what the skeptic wants you to justify. But um, yeah, he gave like the very commonsensical one. Uh, and yeah, Peter Klein gives a similar response to um, the one you were referring to before, that skeptical, uh, like scenarios, skeptical questions and stuff, they presuppose a certain degree of knowledge. Uh, it might be possible for the skeptic to escape that, just, you know, saying he's granting those assumptions for the sake of argument and still showing that you can't have knowledge. So um, sometimes I think skepticism is harder to refute than that, but um, there's certainly something to be gained in some of these responses. Uh, minimally, they're interesting. Uh, I think the uh, Russellonian one's pretty good too, where, you know, I, and I've used it several times is when, you know, you get to the point, like, I just don't have any good reason to deny that I have two hands in front of me, you know? I, I And I think that, for me, that's that's the route I've taken so many times. But you know, if you examine these these things, they have their own 
problems too. So it's like, can we come to a, 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 a complete theory here, you know, or is it one of these things we're going to be discussing forever? It, it kind of reminds me of, of the age old painting of Plato and Aristotle walking together and Plato's pointing up and uh, Aristotle's pointing inward with his little book there. So yeah, it's, it, it, it comes to that. I mean, are we ever going to figure that out? You know, <laughs> one day maybe. Yeah, a lot of the hardest questions of philosophy are kind of the ones that endure, right? Like the yeah. problem of the criterion or the the Agrippin trilemma, right? Like these problems go back to ancient, ancient philosophy, and there's still not, you know, any agreed upon answer to a lot of them. Uh, yeah. So people make like big deals out of modern problems, like like the Gettier problem that just like came up since the yeah. 1960s. I don't yeah. think it's going to last. Uh, I think Bertrand Russell solved that problem before it ever came up. And like, it's just, it, it's people are like all hyped up about it right now, but I don't think that's a problem that's going to endure, but like in a hundred, 200 years, yeah, people are still going to be discussing the Agrippin trilemma. So you look kind of look at these issues that have always been with us and that there's never been a agreed upon solution. Those are like the, the big problems of philosophy. Yeah. And, you know, the Gittier, the Gittier issue, you know, people do make a big deal about it. it. It's kind of put it on the instead of like maybe the back burner, it, it put it on the front burner, you know, and this is what's discussed, you know, the Gittier issue there. So and that's justified true belief. Right. So uh, the issues that, that are concerned, but, but even if so, I see there's there's problem with every model that, that you 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 put out there. I mean, there's several. You know, and that's why I say, like, for me, it's easier just to pick a little bit from here and there and just say, OK, this is kind of like I lean here. OK, this does make sense, but they're all like incomplete. So but anyways. So, so what's the next topic? I don't know. We have any we have anyone else who wants to come on with us? Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Man, I'll, I'll we're just boring. We're boring people our, to death. Our, our, I was hoping to see some of our, our friends come on. But yeah, you yeah. were talking about the age of the, about earth. the age of the earth. Oh, I brought that up, yeah, because you uh, you needed you you looked like you were struggling before I was on here, so I was like, you know, I I'll, was, I'll give him a topic. Man, yeah, I was because I was I was, I was like, like, what am I? What are we gonna what actually gonna talk about? I had a topic I was gonna talk to you about, but I kind of needed you to talk to about it, you know. So I was like, okay, I can introduce the show. Maybe he'll get on like when I introduce it, he'll be able to link in. So yeah, so yeah, age of the earth. So let's, let's so, jump over. Can, jump over. Can, can you tell us why you're a heretic and you take man's word over God's word and you believe that the earth is old? Oh, wow. Well, yeah, I think that that's what the text reads. So is that man's word? Is, you know, the Bible's man's word? And, and or is the Bible written by men, should I say? Uh, how are we supposed to interpret that word? Uh, so that's that's what it comes down to. How do we interpret the word of God? So, yeah, I, I think definitely that definitely that uh, the the way you read it, you have to read Genesis as you got to read it literarily. You know, you have to read it in its proper context. And I do think that context is more outlined in an older view. No, nah, I don't interpret it. I just read it. No, you Get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> I always hated that response. Oh, we those got are the hell. people. We got who? Dale's on. What's uh -oh. up, Dale? Hey, David. How's it going? Hey, I'm hearing like... Oh, we got Dale. I'm hearing like an echo. Dale's on. I'm hearing an echo through you, Dale. Do you have earphones? I'm hearing like... Oh, we got Dale. I'm hearing like... I just hear David Russell say like, oh, it's Dale like a million, million times. Yes, yeah, because you, uh, you got to turn... You got to mute your mic when you're not talking real quick. Mute my mic. There you go. And Dale, uh, put some earphones in. Because that's what's causing it. Uh, and uh, uh, try to see where you, what you know port you're using for your audio there. Um, okay. There you go. I got the headphones, got the headphones in. in. I'm still hearing like myself echo. Yeah, I don't know why you're hearing yourself echo. Uh, let me let me mute mine and we'll let you ask. 
Give it a try now. Okay. Okay. Good now. I think so. Hopefully, no. All right. So, Perfect. yeah. How are you so doing? I'm good. Thank you, David. Thank you for inviting me to come on. Yeah, absolutely. Everybody's invited, man. We've tried to get, uh, we got Titus on here earlier. We're talking about pacifism, you know, and, and a third way and, and stuff like that. And then me and David were just talking about epistemology a little bit. So, yeah, is there anything you want to discuss? Uh, okay. So, so, again, I'm having the same problem. Like, it's, I hear you finish and then, like, it's repeating like a sentence from, Oh wow! I, I don't I don't know now because I can hear you fine. <laughs> I'm hearing myself talking now. <laughs> oh man! All right. Well, well. How about you try again, Dale? Like, hang up and then try again. All right. So leave studio. Okay. Yeah, leave studio and try again. So, David, where were we? Well, you got to unmute your mic before. We, we were talking about people who don't know what they don't know, right? The people who say they don't interpret the Bible, they just read it, right? Um, and when I'm dealing with someone who says that, then I know I'm dealing with somebody who um, – it's kind of hard to deal with people like that because they're, they're unaware of their own um, ignorance on certain things, right? And when it's a methodological problem like that where, like, you don't, you don't think that you have to engage in any interpretation when reading scripture and you just, you know, it's just like God imparting thoughts into your head, then, yes, that, I think that's dangerous. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. hear you there. I'm, I'm trying to see if, it, if this may be an issue on my end. Uh, why don't you try it again, uh, David? Start, start talking here. Let me see if there's something. Dale's back. Dale's back. But, yeah. So, Dale, are you back in yet? I am back in, but once again, it's the exact same thing. Like, I'm, I'm listening yeah. to the conversation, the same thing over and over again. That you guys wow. just... I don't know. You know, me and David Johnson were having issues earlier today, too. I don't know if it's just something on my end or on on the the you know the stream or what. Titus came in, though, pretty good. Dale, you could try just putting your question in um, in the comments if you can't. Uh, if, it, if this way is not working, no worries. Okay, uh, so so that's what this is. I'm just supposed to ask you guys. A... Yeah, anything you want. Oh. Or you could talk okay. about anything you want. <laughs> it's weird. Yeah, a anything I want. Okay, so that's the last. Okay. Um, hmm. Okay. All right. Yeah. Um, so, oh my goodness. Okay. Open mic, brother. Open mic. Okay. I, I, um, so, so I guess my thing was, um, one thing I came up with was sort of like, uh, you guys are having guests, you guys are having guests on in the month of February with Gary Habermas. Um, what what is he speaking on? Like the his, the historical Jesus versus yeah, absolutely. Jesus. Absolutely. Uh, that have you, sir? Are you watching the screen here too, Dale? I am. Yeah. That's um, probably why you're having this. He says, "Ask him if he has a YouTube window open with the stream." A, a YouTube window with what? Open with the stream. Open with the stream. You may be hearing from the browser. Um, okay. Yeah. I have no idea what that, what that means. Like I remember I'm not a, <laughs> um, yeah. So what do I click to, to stop hearing from the browser? Uh, yeah. Oh, just, okay. uh, click, take out the, uh, YouTube window that you have open with the stream, keep the stream going, but keep the YouTube, uh, thing up that you're watching, turn it off. Oh, okay. Is yeah. How can you hear us now? Yeah. Oh, thank goodness. Okay, you guys are actually normal. It's not like a million <laughs> voices at once. All right, <laughs> we got it. 
we got another guest too here. So uh, yeah, Dale, go ahead and ask your question and then I'm going to bring on our next guest too, so he can uh, respond to us as well. Okay. Uh, so, so yeah, if you guys are talking about to you, Gary Habermas and the topic is the historical Jesus, um, I guess, what do you guys think is the best evidence that um, the historical Jesus uh, is true? Um, and what do you think is the hardest evidence on the mythicist side uh, to deal with proving that Jesus didn't exist, allegedly? Awesome. Awesome. That, that's a good question. Uh, David, I'm going to let you uh, hit it first. I just want to welcome uh, Darth Dawkins. How you doing, bud? Yeah, that's funny. I thought maybe he was having a problem with the browser, but now that I've entered the stream, now I'm hearing myself. So, You're hearing it through David Pullman's mic. All right. Now, now, now does it sound normal? Yeah. 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 It's David Pullman's. He's having issues too. Okay. It's all good. Yeah. I'm the only That's one with uh, <laughs> uh, awesome. Man. I just wanted to welcome uh, you before we get started talking about uh, 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 this historical Jesus. Uh, uh, David, go ahead and respond. All right. So uh, you gave the, you asked the question, um, like, what's the, the strongest evidence that the historical Jesus is true? By that, do you mean that uh, there was a historical Jesus who actually existed or uh, that you know, that, that there was a historical Jesus, but that he's the same as the Jesus that we believe in. I'm, I'm not sure which question you were asking there. Uh, I guess, I guess the former. Just like a general. Okay, yeah. Like yeah, so I mean, I mean, there's the old arguments, uh, you know, we go through like Josephus, Tacitus, right, Pliny the Younger, uh, the uh, various arguments from secular sources. And the reason that those arguments, I think, are popular is because they, um, you know, are from secular sources. So they're uh, presumably the atheists uh, or mythicists are not going to be as skeptical of those sources. Uh, but I think that the best uh, evidence is just the New Testament itself, that we have the best evidence in the New Testament. Uh, you need to give, uh, or at least the mythicist needs to give some kind of explanation for how you have um, these stories coming up, uh, you know, and at least in some cases, purportedly eyewitness uh, accounts, being written about Jesus, uh, if there's absolutely you know nothing there, um, then some really strong account has to be provided that's got better evidence uh, that that's simpler than just the hypothesis that you know Jesus existed. And I know that there's different types of mythicism. Some will grant that there might have been some sort of you know a like quasi Jesus figure or something like that. Uh, and so, uh, just you know, it's kind of going to depend on what sort of mythicism you hold. But I think that's the the strongest point is you've got to explain the existence of the New Testament. And then to the second question of, you know, what's the strongest evidence on the mythicist side? Uh, my problem there is that they don't really give a whole lot. Uh, the most of what I see, you know, from like reading like Carrier and Daughtry and uh, Price and people like that is it's mostly all just like taking down positive arguments, right? They'll give arguments against the credibility of Josephus, arguments against, um, Tacitus arguments, you know, why we can't trust the Gospels and stuff. I don't, or at least I haven't seen a whole lot by way of positive argumentation for thinking that uh, Jesus is not a historic or was not a historical figure. All right. Yeah. You know, Dale, like I would just comment on that. I, I'll piggyback off of what David was saying there. So uh, we got, me and him are pretty similar to this. Uh, yeah. I, you, you know, with Habermas, though, I'll answer that question is, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try in the interview, I'm looking at it like an arrow and I kind of, it's funny because Gary asked me before he came on, he said, Hey, uh, uh, can we narrow it down and stuff like that and start categorizing it? And I just, I was already doing that in my head when he sent me that. So it was like, yeah, I'm thinking along those same lines. So I kind of looked at it like an arrow. I'm going to start with the existence of, 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 of Jesus. And then we're going to work in an arrow to point finally to the resurrection and why they're, uh, and the good arguments that, uh, you know, exist out there for that. And I think, you know, the minimal flax is good. Uh, I think Gary's approach is, is great. I also think, uh, the historical reliability of the gospels are pretty as well established. I think that there's better arguments for than against. So yeah, that's where I would, I would, I would leave it, Dale. Um, yeah, and I'm going to move on to Darth Dawkins because he's been sitting here uh, waiting patiently. So what do you got, bud? 
Well, I debate atheists on a regular basis and defend Christianity on Discord, and occasionally I'll be devil's advocate, and I'll converse with naive Christians who think they can debate, you know, evidentially for the Christian worldview, and I'll simply point out, you could successfully persuade somebody that Jesus rose again from the dead, then they can just sit there and say, well, it doesn't follow from that that there's a God. In a, in a large universe, sometimes strange things happen. What are you going to do then? Yeah, yeah that's, that's, yeah, that's good. You know, I'll, I'll hit this one. You know, I'm going to keep apology. So I am, I try to meet you people where they're up. at. Could you repeat your last two sentences, I, please? I'm a, yeah, I'm a cumulative case apologist. So I like to try to meet people where they're at. That doesn't work. It, not always. You're right. No, Sometimes you have work. to take. It doesn't work at all. Would you it like doesn't to work at all. Why not? No, because you're already you're already you're already catering to, catering to the unbelievers' false beliefs. So you've already oh, okay. given them all they need to do to reject what you're saying. It doesn't matter how much probabilistic reasoning you give them. At the end of the day, they could just shrug their shoulders and just say, you know, these are just strange things that just happened in a big universe. What okay. do you say then? All right, David, I'll let you take tackle this one a little bit too. All right, Dark Doc is just a presuppositional yes, as I'm picking is, up yes. from this. Yes, so um, here's how I would go about that is I would argue uh, from inference to the best explanation, right? So I there you could that's always not logically necessitated. Well, no, it's not logically necessitated. That's the no, point. It's an inference to lost. the best explanation. It, it no, 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 you haven't. An inference to the best explanation. Call. It's a that's a judgment yes. call. Okay, and and there if are you reasons have a dedicated to support it. Unbeliever. Unbelievers are not unbelievers because they lack evidence. Okay. Let me ask you this question. Is everything indicative of the creator? No. Okay, well, not, now you're not biblical. Okay, Romans 1. Okay, ever since Where does Romans 1 the, say everything? Where does Romans it say everything? 1, ever since the beginning of the creation of the world, his eternal powers can be clearly seen through what has been made, through what is... Ex, uh, where, where does so it say everything? Kind of okay, it says... Where, where does it say made? everything? I'm answering. Where does it say everything? You does want it say an everything that has been made? You're going to cut say me everything? off? Are you going to let me finish? You've been cutting me off through this whole conversation. No, I'm pointing out to you that um, you, you're making a fundamental mistake. Okay, so do you believe that some things are evidence for God? Many yes. things are evidence for God, or all things are yes. evidence for God? Some things. Okay, let me tell you why that's uh, philosophically fallacious. Okay, God cannot coexist in a world where some temporal states do not necessitate referencing Him. You understand that? Could you spell that out more explicitly? Okay, in a world where God is, okay, and I'm, of course, I'm a, I'm a Bible-believing Christian, but I'm trying to show you how well, that line of reasoning ultimately fails, okay? In a world where God is as creator, he's the concrete universal. In other words, he institutes all possibility and impossibility, right? He imposes the particulars, he imposes all the categories, and he sustains them. So consequently, that means is that all temporal states that are not God stand in causal relations to God. Do you agree with that? Uh, to what I understood of that, yes. Okay. So that means then everything is evidence of God. Mm, how does that follow? Because evidence means that something stands in causal relations to something else. Okay. I, I understand evidence to mean that something uh, indicates the truth of something else okay. or that it makes okay. it probable. Yeah, well, let me, let, me, let me try from a different angle here, okay? Uh, the rock on the side of the road, can it be a fact without the necessity of referencing God? Uh, I would say yes. No, it can't. Let me tell you why, okay? The rock on the side of the road in a Christian worldview is only what it is uh, in, uh, its in its inception, inception and implementation and because it starts in the mind of God, mind of God and is implemented within the plan of God. So a fact is only what it is within the plan of God. Okay. So the plan of God, which is the result of the mind of God, is the ultimate metaphysical reference in order to make the facts what they are. If you do not take that approach, which is a biblical approach, that things are only what they are within the mind of God, right? Then what you're saying is you can have facts that don't require God as the ultimate reference point. If a fact can exist, any fact at all, without God as its ultimate reference point, then you don't have a fact, right? Maybe it would be helpful if you tell us what you mean by ultimate reference point. 
Um, the ultimate reference point is whatever is going to be fundamental and ultimate, the source of all possibility and impossibility. It will be the ultimate frame of reference, metaphysical background information that makes the particulars what, what they are. Okay? Now that will be, now that that will be, that will be the metaphysical, be the metaphysical context. context. So the metaphysical context for all facts in the Christian worldview is the context of eternal God, starting with his mind, then the implementation in his plan. So God himself and his redemptive plan of human history is the final and the ultimate and the beginning frame of reference or metaphysical contextual reference in order for facts to be what they are. Now, do you believe that a, you can have a fact without context? Depends on what you mean by that. How are you defining context? Okay, a context would be um, something is what it is in relation to the whole. So, for example, in other words, you're YouTube, asking, can you? If you go to a YouTube a video that shows optical illusions, right, and there are several good ones and entertaining ones, and you form. Um, an evaluation as to what the facts are. Then the camera moves back and you realize that what you thought were the facts were not in fact the facts because now you have a fuller contextual background information. So you, you reformulate what you used to think is the fact, new facts, right? So facts are only what they are in terms of their context. Now for any given fact, there can be several concentric rings um, metaphysically or in a worldview that makes the facts the facts but the ultimate contextual situation is going to have to be that it, it is God right now if you present facts implicitly or explicitly that do not reference God then you have no facts at all they will simply be brute facts a brute fact is something that is putatively existing that has no ultimate reference point as to why it exists. In God's world, there cannot be brute facts. Why? It's because all facts are created facts by God. Okay? How about the fact of God himself? Is he a brute fact, or would you say he's not no, a fact? No. no. God, God himself, being that he is, he is ultimate and absolute, he is a-se. In theology, we say that's the a of God. He's complete. He's non-derivative. He needs nothing external and independent of himself to be what, what he is. So God is not a brute fact. A brute fact has no explanation as to why it exists, either within itself or independently or externally to itself. God himself is a That's called the aseity of God. He is self-existent. He is a necessary being. He's self-contained. Okay? So God cannot be a brute fact. Right? So when you start when you start capitulating unwittingly, and I used to do I used to do this. Now, the fact that I've changed my view doesn't necessarily make make me right, but what a lot of unbelievers are doing is they're capitulating to certain false beliefs of unbelievers that they can have certain facts that exist independently and without reference to God, and then they try to build upon that. So let me explain to you why that's a problem. Okay? Suppose we have a syllogism and we say premise one, premise two, premise three, therefore God, okay? If, if God is not established in any of the premises, then you cannot conclude God, because God could not be the conclusion where he is the creator and sustainer of all things, where there is any premise that it can exist without reference or its origin in God. So this, it's very tempting to try to build a cumulative case. Now, having said that, I'm not against presenting historical evidences as to why people should believe some things, like why should we believe in Jesus? We can explain the historical sequences that occurred about what Jesus said, what he did, his apostles, they were eyewitnesses, they wrote it down, things like that. That's important. But evidences should not and cannot be presented in such a way that compromise any major scriptural doctrines or that cater to unbelievers' false beliefs that they have about themselves or the world. Okay? So this is the problem with evidentialism. The problem isn't some of the facts that they're explaining as to why we believe. 
The problem is, is they, comp they combine an appeal to certain historical occurrences, which is fine, but they mix that with catering to one or more of the false beliefs of an unbeliever. So, for example, that the unbeliever has, uh, possesses autonomous reasoning, that they can reason about this world, about any facts at all, without starting with the acknowledgement of God as creator, or that God is the ultimate contextual reference. Okay? So, that's in so, a nutshell. I can elaborate, I can elaborate further, further, but it's seriously problematic. I, yeah, I, I, I get yeah. you, Darth. Uh, David, I'll let you respond. Thanks for calling, Darth. Uh, we'll have you back on uh, in a little bit, maybe, if we have another question here. I just wanted Dale and uh, David to give a quick response and welcome Clinton Wilcox of the Mentionables, which David forget, keeps forgetting to mute his mic. So I'm echoing all the time. <laughs> What's up, Clinton? I can hear you barely. If many of you don't know that Clinton was actually with us on the Christmas extravaganza. Dale, uh, while Clinton gets his thing figured out here, uh, I'm going to let you respond to that, uh, what you just heard from Darth Dawkins real quick. Yeah, so so one thing that just interested me, so I, I agree Um God is exists ase. Um, he is the ultimate explanation of everything that exists. Um, I, I did find it interesting that he linked everything to the divine mind. I think there are thing, things are grounded in God, like moral moral facts are grounded in God's moral nature, not his mind necessarily. So there may be some difference there. Um, sorry. Okay. Uh, I didn't say anything. Good. Um, but yeah, the, the thing that struck me is I, I think that there's a, a difference between provability and so so it's a fact that everything ultimately is grounded in God in some way for its existence. That's the ultimate explanation, that sort of thing. But in order to prove a certain thing, like from an evidentialist case, starting with proving the Jesus resurrection, it's not necessary to establish that G God is the ultimate grounding of every fact that exists in order to do that. I think we can bypass that and start at a certain certain point and then establish the case from that you don't need to set up all the steps in everything um in each case so that's sort of my initial take on what are you saying but yeah yeah all right david i'm gonna right, give david, you a quick, give you a quick response yeah i was afraid the uh lecture was never gonna end so uh yeah um I mean, there were a lot of points. I mean, there where he was using. Well, he's like you. He's a presuppositionalist. So I thought I'd let you guys talk it out a little bit. It's unfortunate that um, you know, he will throw um like these statements out there, and I'm kind of like wish he would define some of the terms in there. Uh, but um, in any case, you know, I'll I'll go to the one point is that he uh says that for example, evidentialism is predicated on the view that human reasoning is autonomous, and of course, it's not fully autonomous, but it is autonomous in the sense that we do not believe that you have to presuppose the existence of God, the truth of Christianity, uh, the truth of the Bible, anything like that. So yes, I would defend the truth that um human reasoning is autonomous in that way. Uh, and I mean, like Greg Bonson would argue against that by saying, um, you know, oh, well, you've got the problem of the criteria, you've got the problem of induction, you've got the problem of deduction. And yes, we've got these problems, but we can solve these problems through autonomous human reasoning. So uh, these don't seem like they uh, present much of an argument against it. So his, his entire speech there was predicated on the assumption that um, human reasoning is not autonomous. Well, that's where the argument needs to go then. And I'm happy to defend that human reasoning is autonomous. And so if it is, then, you know, the presuppositionalist, uh, his argument is not going to go through. Right on. Well, again, we have Clinton Wilcox. Uh, Clinton, what's up, man? Hey, how's it going? Oh, uh, so way better. Yeah, because <laughs> I was I was originally going through my uh, my laptop mic, but uh, I'm here with my friend uh, Devin Palou, and I went and grabbed his mic because I oh, figured nice. that would sound a lot better. Nice. So what do you um, want to talk about, bud? Well, I'm, I'm not sure. I actually don't know what, what this open mic is all about, so I'm just kind of here checking it out. Uh, yeah, also, man. I felt naked without my hat, so I had to go grab it, too. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. I always have this. This is my signature hat, so it's yeah. like, you know, I, I get you there. I yeah. get you. Uh, but, yeah, so, yeah, 
obviously we just got bombarded with presuppositionalism, which <laughs> it's cool. You know, we can we can talk about pre presupp. That's fine. Um, and because David Palman's a presupper, I, I allow that. You know, so okay. uh, <laughs> right. yeah, that's what Nick Peters tells me. Yeah, yeah. Well, what on earth is between you and Nick Peters and David Palman? What did, what what happened? Uh, <laughs> I just gotta ask. Oh, uh, just fun, fun, fun. Uh, picking is is really what they're doing. Yeah, the friendly okay. rivalry kind of thing. Friendly rivalry kind of thing. If anyone yeah, found out why Nick Peters has it in for me, like please let me know because I don't know what I did. Yeah, well, it's great when when we bring you on because he he stops picking on me when that happens. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we, we've been talking about, uh, you know, uh, the resurrection a little bit. We talked about presuppositional epistemology. Uh, what, what, what tickles your fancy in apologetics, Clinton? Well, um, I mean, you know, I kind of found Darth Dawkins to be uh, kind of uh, arrogant and pushy. Uh, I would kind of encourage him to, uh, you know, be a lot more, you know, open and receptive to other people who disagree because, you'll be able to be a lot more convincing if you're not just telling people, uh, you know, you're wrong and speaking down at them saying, let me educate you on why you're wrong and I'm right. Um, so yeah, that was, that was just, yeah, it's a little, uh, little, you know, that was something that was just kind of a, kind of my own pet peeve. Yeah. A little bit. Yeah. You know, I, you know, he did interrupt David quite a few times and then was upset when David was trying to respond and mm. got on him for interrupting him. So, it, you know, yeah. Respect's got to go both ways there, and I, I don't mind hearing the precepts case. I really don't. I, mm. There's some things I think that they do well, and there's a lot of things I don't think they do well at all. But mm. that's uh, a you know that's a different you know, that's position a different there. Position. David, go ahead. I think the entire presuppositionalist edifice is um, no offense to my precept friends, but I think it is really garbage epistemology. I don't think there's anything of value uh, in any distinctive of presuppositionalism. Now, that's not to say that they don't have anything good in their system. It's just that whatever I find useful in the presuppositionalist system, every other system adopts that as well. So they can't like claim to have um, mm -hmm. a monopoly on transcendental arguments, moral arguments, right. exposing incoherencies within other worldviews. You know, everyone does that. So whatever is unique to them, which to me goes back to this rejection of autonomous human reasoning, it, that's just wrong. Human reasoning is autonomous. And sorry, that's just the fact of the matter. Yeah, I mean, you know, God himself says in Isaiah, come let us reason together. Um, you know, uh, he, he gave us a rational nature. Surely he intends for us to use it. Um, yeah. So yeah, so I, I'm a classical apologist myself. And yeah, you know, I, I don't, I, I think presuppositionalism itself is, uh, well, actually, they agree that it's circular. They just, uh, they just have this a uh, wacky idea that it's a that it's a virtuous circle where I've never I, or I study logic and I've never once seen a logic textbook or a book on fallacies ever say that circular reasoning can be virtuous. So um, yeah. yeah, so and yeah, like you were saying, even in classical apologetics, uh, you know, the transcendental argument is used in classical apologetics. We agree with them that God is the ultimate standard of morality and beauty and and you know even reason itself. But you know that doesn't mean that that atheists can't also uh, reason, you know, it's like, uh, you know, God has even said that he's placed the moral law in our hearts. So obviously we can engage in moral reasoning, even, uh, apart from God. So, yeah. And, uh, yeah, I would, I would agree as well. Uh, we've got another guest on, uh, Travis worth. Travis, say hey, hi, how's, buddy. Hey, how's my, uh, audio? Yeah, it's good, bud. I can hear you. Okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, I'm just setting up my new laptop and working on my homework. So, uh, I saw you guys were on. Thought I'd see what's going on here. Yeah, man, we were we we're just talking about anything and everything. We we're just talking about presuppositionalism and how we're all classicalists here. And and I'm an accumulative I'm an accumulative case guy myself, but I do use yeah. a lot of the uh, the classical methodology uh, in, in any type of formalized debate. Uh, Darth Dawkins is actually. Uh, um, challenging you to a debate david so if you ever want to do that on a presuppositionalism we can make that happen darth i am not ignoring darth, you buddy i am, I am just, buddy. just giving uh everybody a chance to speak <laughs> what's up darth Dawkins? Yeah, <laughs> yeah so what's the uh, you know this is the first i've heard of this open mic uh caleb johnson actually sent all of the mentionables a, a message and say hey if you're not doing anything you know, maybe go yeah. pop on here. Is it just kind of a general discussion? General discussion, or? man. Just having fun. Uh, we're kicking off February, so uh, okay. 
we're actually we've got some really good good stuff coming up in February. Uh, I, I would say just check it out. We've got uh, Jay Warner Wallace on the first. We've got Gary Habermas uh, coming up on the sixth. And oh, you've got uh, like a God's Not Dead kind of thing going on here. <laughs> uh, yeah, and then I've got uh, Fuzzrana that's coming on later in the month too. Okay. And then we've got several discussions that our guests have put together. <laughs> uh, Travis is one of them, and uh, Dale is is going to be on that too. So yeah, it's just oh, going to cool. be a great conversation all the way around. Hmm. So yeah, just I had a lot of fun. yeah, uh, yeah, I had Fuzzrana on my uh, podcast too last year. Oh yeah, yeah. Guy. You know, reasons to believe they are uh, guys. If you don't know who reasons to believe is. Get to know them. They are super nice, super friendly, and they're willing to oh. interact with you. Yes, yeah. definitely. They're the, uh, they're the ones I actually came to faith uh, through, and uh, I'm actually uh, in, enrolled in their school working on my certificate of science apologetics through them. Oh, that's cool. Cool. Yeah, I saw yeah. that they had that out there, but I, I couldn't sign up for that too, and then be doing three to four classes <laughs> at a time. So, yeah, yeah see, I, I got two going on in addition, in addition to the reasons to believe thing. That's why I heard. Uh, I don't know exactly what uh, David, you and Darth were talking about, but I, I strongly disagree. I, I think uh, apologetics is uh, best through through an evidential case. I didn't know exactly where y'all were going with that, but. I would strongly disagree I with would Darth. Strongly disagree with Darth. Yeah, Darth was trying to um, educate me on that. You know, we all really know that God exists, and that Romans one says everything uh, t- is evidence for God's existence, and uh, apparently somehow that teaches presuppositionalism. But anyway, yeah, <laughs> that's what it was over. Yeah. Well, I, it, I it seems like it seems like with that, wouldn't that just apply to like a philosophical God, like general theism? How would that? Applied to the Judeo-Christian faith. I've never really understood that. I've never really understood that. Oh, it wouldn't. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so, so give them a quick uh, <laughs> give them a quick explanation, David. Come on. Don't, don't leave them in the wind there. Uh, so, I mean, if you read Van Til, and Van Til is just painful to read, but uh, a big argument he had is that there's this traditional problem in philosophy, the problem of the one and the many. And uh, his argument was that oh, well, only uh, the Trinity can solve this problem because uh, we've got, you know, at, at the very foundation of everything, we've got a God who is both one, but also many. And so, you know, that solves. Uh, so, that, so that's why it has to be the triune God of scripture. And I mean, of course, I mean, that's a garbage argument because you can parody that and, you know, say, oh, well, you know, I'm going to posit a God who's four and one. I can posit a God who's five and one. I mean, you can get this problem of the one and the many solved the exact same way uh just through that assuming you had to go that route at all and i mean i think aristotle solved the problem of the one and the many without ever appealing to the triune god so um you know you you don't have to go that route to do it but that's generally how they would try to get to uh the christian god is they'll say he has to be triune in order to solve this problem right that's interesting yeah. So, Clint, you you had a question real quick. Uh, what did you want to ask, Bud? Yeah. So, actually, something just kind of occurred to me when you brought up uh, reasons to believe. Uh, Hugh Ross is someone that I've been familiar with for a while. Uh, I've, for most of my life, been a young Earth creationist, but I uh, fairly recently became an old Earth creationist uh, through listening to some of the uh, um, some of the lectures by William Lane Craig. Um, I'm not I'm not an evolutionist. I, I'm still very much skeptical about evolution. But uh, I'm more accepting now of old earth creationism. Um, and yeah, I see David over there celebrating David Palman. But uh, oh. I, I should I should probably state I'm not 100 percent like I could not. It's not the case that I couldn't be persuaded to go back to young earth. But I think because the evidence is so strong for an old earth and uh, the, the, the chapters of Genesis, you know, Genesis one and two can be open to uh, to a different interpretation. I think that uh, old earth is kind of the way that I lean. Um, but. Uh, I'm actually going to be homeschooling my nieces starting this next year. And uh, I'm going to go through an organization called Classical Conversations because I'm very much also in favor of, you know, the classical style education. I'm a Thomist myself, and I, I believe that's the best uh, best way to to educate. Um, but uh, the question I was thinking of is because I, I'm, I'm planning on also giving them, you know, teaching them, uh, you know, the Bible, uh, apologetics, philosophy, things like that. And so I, I just kind of wanted to get your guys' thoughts on uh, how do you, do you, you know, 
I guess because one of the things that's probably going to be touched on will be creation versus evolution. And so uh, my my thoughts are I, I want to uh, teach both or maybe even all three if we include intelligent design, but I want to teach them in a way that uh, that anyone who holds to that view could say, yeah, that's what I believe. You know, I don't want to caricature intelligent design or evolution while I'm teaching it because my thought is, uh, you know, I don't want them growing up thinking that they have to reject evolution or, uh, or not be a Christian because if they, if they go to college and start accepting evolution, I'm concerned that they might reject Christianity over that. So the way that I'm leaning is I should teach them intelligent design and evolution and then let them come to their own conclusions and let them know no matter what position they ultimately decide on, all three are compatible with Christianity. Uh, what, what what do you uh, what what do you think about that? Oh, just real quick, I saw a comment from the Magic Man, and yeah, I, I totally agree, uh, Magic Man. Uh, but uh, I was uh, I my what I was actually wanting to do is substituting the YEC text and throwing in some texts that are more intelligent design and evolution friendly. So that, that's why I just kind of wanted to get you know everyone's thoughts on what on how they feel if, well, that I should uh, proceed with this. I'm gonna let let our professor, our notorious professor here, Dale, mm -hmm. answer this real quick. Uh, and then I, we'll follow up and give our examples here. Dale, you got anything on this? Oh, goodness. Um, okay, so so in the first place, yeah, I, I agree with Clinton. I, I was really impressed with William Lane Craig's take on Genesis 1 through 11 being mytho his, of the mytho-history genre. Um, you know, I, there's a couple reasons, especially, that kind of persuaded me to say that that's the most likely genre for it. So... You know, obviously, you you want to teach them about the genre of the text and being aware of the the different takes on that. Um, in terms of intelligent design, so yeah, I would say just just sort of make them aware of the various positions that are out there. Um, maybe link them to some sources. Uh, there, there's I forget what it is off the top of my head, but there is one great source uh, by some Presbyterian organization that lays out all of the positions, you know, young earth creationism, uh, you know, the myth, the myth theory, the John Walton's theory, all, all of the theories, and it gives like the pro and the cons for it. So yeah, like maybe I could send that to David Russell if I remember the link and he can send that to you to take a look at. Oh, that'd be great. I'd really appreciate that. Yep. And I'll, I'll be sure to keep in touch with that. Uh, David Paulman, I'm going to let you uh, just tackle that real quick too. Since you're the single guy, you Since know, you're the single guy. <laughs> uh, have you read uh, Zondervan's four views on creation, evolution, and intelligent design? No, I haven't. No, I haven't. Okay. That's a really good resource. Uh, it came out, I think 2017. So it's, it's fairly current, but um. I enjoy it because you've got uh, the yeah. each each chapter is written by one of the heads of uh, like one of the big origins um, hmm. institutions. So you know you've got Ken Ham doing uh, young Earth creationism, you've got Hugh Ross doing old Earth creationism, Stephen Meyer doing intelligent design, and uh, Deborah Hartsma doing uh, theistic evolution. And uh, so you know these are all you know well known representatives of their view. Uh, and I just say uh, that I think it's a good idea that you are really presenting the full range here because the way it was taught to me, I was homeschooled and like. I was taught it's young earth creationism or it's atheism and uh, you know, atheism and evolution. And like, I just, you know, for so long thought that was, you know, that, that, that's it. And uh, so, you know, it's helpful to know that there's a distinction between the issue of evolution and the age of the earth, right. You can come over to the old right. earth side without capitulating evolution. You can go yeah, the that, whole you know nine right, yards right. and become an evolutionist. Right. What's that? I said, yeah, that's yeah, where yeah, I'm at. Yeah, I'm yeah. older yeah, creation, but I, do, I don't accept evolution. I don't accept evolution. So right, yeah, uh, I'm right there what, with you, so, but uh, what, yeah, go ahead, Travis. Oh yeah, um, sorry, there's a bit of a delay on my audio. Um, yeah, I was gonna say I'm going through uh, the class I, I'm actually doing right now is uh, like the different interpretations. It's uh, science and the Bible, and it's really cool because it's laying out the different views. Uh, I, I'm kind of partial to the analogical day view, which is like it could be like an age of time, but mm -hmm. it, it's. Uh, used in the 24 hour sense for like a six to one pattern. And then there, you know, but it, it's really cool because it's going over the different views, like the calendar day view, uh, the day age view, the framework view, uh, temple inauguration. And um, you, one thing that's really cool too, and that almost all scholars will agree upon is like, it, it's in its immediate context, it's sort of a polemic. And then it becomes like, you know, how do we look at it now? And I've, 
I found either the day age or the analogical day day view is uh, the most accurate in, in my opinion, scientifically and biblically. Yeah, uh, and I'm just going to give you the fatherly advice. Uh, you have right. kids, Clinton? No, uh, I don't have any kids of my own, and uh, that's you know, primarily why I'm going to be homeschooling my nieces. Is because you know my my uh, well, first of all, I wanted to homeschool them because uh, you know public school now is just becoming kind of a trash heap and uh they're going through some uh, some it's like emotional heat. problems yeah, and right. <laughs> so yeah for their own emotional spiritual and intellectual development uh i i want to school them myself because i can't trust the public school to do it and i don't yeah. have any kids of my own so i figure you know I, that gives me the time to homeschool you know my nieces uh, instead yeah yeah you know okay so the fatherly advice that i would give is you know i have four kids and I have two teenagers and two young ones. So I've got an infant, uh, uh, a five-year-old, a fourteen-year-old, and a fifteen-year-old. Uh, I've always come at I've always come at the approach of inoculating versus uh, isolating. Hmm. So yeah, my kids go to public school, and yeah, it's a dung heap, and you've got to keep up with it. You know, you've got to keep up with with uh, what they're learning, and uh, when you're homeschooling. I would say yes. You definitely have to inoculate them to the other views. Uh, that's that to me. That's tantamount. Otherwise, it's kind of like you're hiding something. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and yeah. You, you want to school should be a place where thought is promoted. Hmm. It should be a place where, Agreed. yeah, that that you teach different varying views, and you give good reasons for your own views. You hmm. know. So yeah, inoculate them. Uh, tell them. Tell them how to think or not tell them how to think, but give them the the views to make them think right. and then go from there, man. Yeah. And that, that's pretty much my advice there. Okay. But yep. yeah. Anybody got anything to add before we move on? I, I think David Palman's uh, uh, phone died. So, oh. which I got to kind of got to say, thank right. God, because his, uh, his echo was killing me whenever he would leave his <laughs> mic on. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I was just going to say, Clinton, I, I posted the link to the article I was referring to. I think it's the same one that Travis was mentioning as well. But um, yeah, I don't know if that's appropriate for kids. I didn't realize you, you were talking about kids. So. Yeah. yeah, I think it is. Uh, is, is it the Reasons to Believe course from Re Reasons Institute? Is that it? No, it's a PCA report. Um, oh, okay, okay. Yeah, report of the Creation Study Committee the pca oh i just tried to uh load it up here and it said it can't be accessed uh oh i don't know it's well, maybe maybe we can find it oh. some another way and then send it to you later oh, oh you know what actually hold on uh, i think i may have goofed up on copy and pasting it <laughs> it helps to get that right yeah yeah let's try again yeah yeah, what's really cool too is I have that book David was talking about, it, and it's it's really interesting because it lays out like the four views of like uh, old Earth creation, uh, theistic evolution, young Earth, and intelligent design, and they present their models and they all interact with each other. So it's really cool. You can kind of see the the head people interacting with like critiques and everything. Yeah, yeah. that the four views that if you get any chance, uh, always look at the four views. Uh, this is like. Uh, isn't a new movement, but they, they have a lot of books. They have four views on apologetics, uh, uh, providence, foreknowledge. I'm going through the foreknowledge one right now myself, which is pretty cool. Oh, nice. And they got yeah. William Lane Craig in there. They've got uh, uh, Hunt in there. Uh, who else? Greg, Greg Boyd uh, for open theism. It's just a lot of different – there are four different views on it, and they do it uh, with a whole bunch of different views. Uh, do they have one on hell yet? I, I don't know about that. They do, yeah. Counter okay. Counterpoints, they, yeah. Uh, but I was just going to say the the one that you're mentioning with William Lane Craig and, and Greg Boyd, and that, that's the one I used um, when I was d discussing with Chris Date on Calvinism versus uh, Molinism. So yeah, that one's a good one. So where do you where do you fall on that one, Dale? I haven't a oh, Molinism there. Oh, well, have you not heard of my famous Molinistic Defeater? Um, <laughs> so that's where that comes from. Uh, okay, it's it's me. <laughs> so yeah. so uh, me and Dale come from another podcast as well called Skeptics and Seekers. Uh, actually, Caleb, Clinton, Caleb was on that with us uh, a couple weeks back. Oh, yeah? 
yeah, it was pretty good. You should check it out. Yeah, actually, um, I've got a I've got a discussion coming up with Chris Date on uh, on the nature of hell uh, in a couple. Oh of months. my, uh, your your traditional view. Yeah, traditional view. Okay. Uh, you know, eternal conscious torment. All right. And well, yeah, so far, probably you're ready, 90- my friend. He comes with a hammer. Yeah, probably ninety five percent of the people I've told so far have told me I'm going to lose. So I don't have a whole lot of confidence being built up <laughs> right now. Well, no. you've got time to actually really, really dig into the books and the literature yeah. on it. Uh, he does come with – he's soft-spoken, but he comes in with a with a mighty hammer. Uh, ask Dale. I mean, me and him both were just like listening, I think, more than we were <laughs> combating him, weren't we, Dale? Yeah, yeah. We, we did the show on, on hell. If you want to get a, a, a link to a Skeptics and Seekers show that me and David Russell did with him. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, so it, it's not a competition. It's about – getting to the truth so yeah just right. he, he he knows his material and that sort of thing but yeah, yeah that's why i told him i want a discussion not a debate <laughs> because uh, i know he has a lot of experience debating and i don't so i want to make sure it's just going to be a, a friendly discussion where no one feels any pressure you know but uh, yeah. we just try to come to the truth of the matter together you there know? you go so. Yeah. Are, out of curiosity, Clinton, are you? Um, you said you're eternal conscious torment. Um, yeah. Good man. Um, but are, do you? Would you take um, what some like Gary Habermas or J.P. Moreland would call the torture chamber model, or more of a quarantine model? You know, yeah. I, I'm not 100 percent decided on that because, um, you know, I, I know that there are alternate ways to interpret some of the passages. Uh, so. You know, so I don't. Yeah, I don't know. I, I'm not 100 percent sold on that. I, I do believe it, it's it's eternal separation from God. So it's at least eternal quarantine. But I do think that there is a sense of of um, you know of of punishment in there. Um, you know, as to whether it's a full blown torture chamber. You know, I'm not I'm not 100 percent sure about that. Gotcha. You know what's interesting is uh, I've read Hugh Ross. He has a book on that, and he actually holds to that. And the way he would defend it, now I disagree, but he would defend it as saying that the torment can be like a form of uh, restraint to kind of restrain the, the widespread of, of the evil. So, that you know, that might be some kind of way to, yeah, that's, to that's support like an eternal. Yeah, yeah. I, I've actually changed my mind several times. Like uh, I used to hold to kind of like the C.S. Lewis version that, uh, you know, that it's like a prison locked from the inside. But uh, I kind of switched... Yeah, yeah, the quarantine. But I've kind of switched to like a conditional immortality and maybe limited or weak uh, universalism. A weak universalism. Wow. Well, you know, um, for like people who haven't heard the gospel or like haven't had a chance to maybe, you know. So, okay. Yeah, I wouldn't, wouldn't really call that. Well, maybe. Dale, what do you think? I don't know if I'd call that weak universalism for people that haven't heard the gospel type deal. Um, yeah, that's more like inclusivism. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, that, and that's my my perspective. Um, yeah. Not, I'm actually uh, reading about that in my philosophy of religion class at this moment. So, yeah, good topic. But <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, I, I think it know, answers the divine hidden as well. Yeah, I, you know, I I hold to the also to the ECT view too, and. You know, I just haven't been able to wrap my mind around uh, annihilationism still yet. I, I just, mm. just like Calvinism, I can't wrap my mind around that either. But <laughs> yeah, do you take the, oh. the quarantine or the torture chamber view? Uh, quarantine. Okay. More, more so what? Uh, man, the best book on hell, guys, is The Great Divorce by C.S. Lewis. Yeah. And, so then, and, uh, yeah. how do you how do you handle verses then that seem to imply that there will be like a fire that never you know like a worm that never dies, the fire that never goes out, things like that. I think yeah, the smoke of their torment. Yeah, I I think you know we're looking at metaphoric language that uh, is describing a state that's going to last forever. Uh, I think that absence of God is that flame, you know, <laughs> in a way. Yeah. So I would I would look at it like that. You know, there's actually a, there's actually another view that says like the the fire or the torment or whatever. <laughs> Is actually God's presence and His holiness just consumes uh, the unrighteous? Yeah, but it, yeah, but it would still apply that they were tortured forever at that point. I think. Yes. Yeah. Right. I'm just saying Dale? that. Oh. Yeah, I think so. The fire is principally like that kind of imagery is symbolic of God's wrath. It's it's standing for wrath and justice and that sort of thing. It's not a literal um, fire. 
um, that's you know going to be burning us alive and that sort of thing. Um, I was actually just when you asked me to speak here, I was looking for the article from Christian Think Tank that really lays out those four views and kind of explains the pros and cons and that sort of thing. But um, yeah, it, it explains. I mean, there, there are opposing metaphors. So J.P. Moreland would would argue this way, right? So you have these metaphors of the fire, but then hell is also darkness. Well, if you take it literally, those are contradictory, right? Fire produces light and that sort of thing. So that's one reason that you've heard that before I take it, Clinton, or? Well, I have, but I've never really found that very convincing because, you know, like if you're, if you're outside camping and it's dark, you can still light a fire, even though it's, it's darkness all around you. So yeah, you know, there'll be light produced by the fire, but it could still be a place of outer darkness even even with the fire burning. So I've never really found that argument to be very convincing. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, I, I guess it's it's you have to kind of see like how the the imagery is being used and does it make sense to try and harmonize them in that way? And yeah, just it, in my books, it doesn't. I, I think they're describing. Um, but yeah, I'm trying to find the the article, but I'll, yeah, I'll find it for you and put it post it up in the chat for everyone. Okay. All right, guys, welcome Tim from Invoking right. Theism yeah, and Caleb you. Johnson from The Mentionables. Uh, oh, hey, Caleb. Howdy, howdy. What's up, Tim? <laughs> hey. right, well, what's going on, guys? What do, you got, what do you want to talk about tonight? Well, uh, can we talk about how we have a little bit of a uh, Muppet Show vibe going on here? <laughs> <laughs> oh. So... Tim, how are you, man? Oh man, I'm I'm doing good, man. How are you? I'm good, man. It's been a while. Yeah. <laughs> right on, right on. Uh Caleb, what's up, buddy? Oh, not much. Trying to keep my kids alive, make sure they don't kill themselves. And hey, uh, well, that's a good thing, man. Yeah. They're trying to learn <laughs> to skateboard, so uh, it's oh, not wow. easy. Yeah. Guys, I tell you, there's one time I went skateboarding and then I did one of those like the skateboard slides out from under you and you're like completely in the air and I landed on my butt bone and it hurt for like a month and I think my back's never been the same since. <laughs> it's crazy, uh -huh. man. You wow. do a lot of stupid things when you're young, man. And then next <laughs> yeah. thing you know, you're like my age now, like I'm 39 and you're like, why did I do all that? <laughs> yeah, I'm paying for it now. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. But anyways, uh, Tim, what do you what do you want to talk about real quick? Oh, I I, I kind of just came in to kind of just hang out. Um, oh, that's fine, man. Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't know what you guys were um, we're, what you we're guys talking were about on. hell. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was a burning topic for tonight. Yeah. Yeah. No burning. Oh, uh, nice. Um, ah, thanks. No, I mean no. I mean that that's actually pretty relevant to me right now because um. Kind of my side pet project along my larger projects right now in terms of my research is um, basically researching the uh, the doctrine of hell. And I'm very much uh, attracted to a um, to a universal reconciliation view. Um, very much attracted to that um, started started going that way philosophically. And um, yeah. now I'm going down the route um, exegetically. And um, from before, I really thought that it was a, um, you know, you hear universalism, right? And there's a difference between Christian universalism and Christian universal reconciliation, for those that might not know. Um, like, you know, there still is a hell. People still, you know, are punished for their sins and things of that sort. But there's a lot, a lot of talk in scripture about about God and Christ reconciling everything to himself. Um, and I don't, so I don't think it's, a, I don't think it's a far off view at all. I don't think it's incoherent at all. I just want to take my time and research um, the views. I am not convinced by eternal conscious torment. Um, I think, no, the, uh, advocates, I think the advocates of annihilationism have done well at uh, exegeting the passages that talk about uh, forever and what seemed like eternity. Um, and um, so now it's just kind of seeing, you know, um, kind of going, okay, well, you know, which view will give God the highest view of love at the same time, um, at the same time um, being uh, philosophically and theologically uh, in accordance with what is kind of what is spelled out in the text that we see. So that's where I'm at 
right now with that. And so I'm very much attracted to it, but I'm not going to say I, I'm 100% in that camp because um, I need to do uh, my my research. I need to spend a lot more time on looking at this. But that's where I'm at in terms of health. Yeah. Uh, Tim, yeah, Tim. Uh, no, Tim, real quick for the audience. Can you explain the difference between uh, – just in a nutshell. You don't have to be long. You don't have to give a, a presentation. But the whole idea for the audience, universal reconciliation – uh, versus uh, um, um, universalism. Yeah, so so basically, yeah, in a nutshell, just put it very simply and, and uh, crudely. Um, Can you? <laughs> yeah, universal reconciliation basically says that um, that um, that in the end, God will be able to, and God will um, reconcile everything. <laughs> all souls back to himself, all persons, all things back to himself. Um, and that includes those that are referred to as like the damned and those that are perishing and things. And basically the view is that um, when God, God's more in the restoration business, the restoring business, um, rather than like a complete reset or um, completely doing something new, that that's what seems to be spelled out in scripture. And so when uh, so the idea is that eventually the the those who have rejected Christ or those who um, never accepted Christ um, will eventually be able to be reconciled uh, back to Christ um, when everything is basically, to put it simply, basically everything is said and done. Um, and another part of that view is that so those in hell, those who, um, those people are basically um paying respectively um uh well are paying for their respective sins they are suffering for their respective sins so it's not like oh you know hitler just goes to heaven right there'll be not a single person in heaven who's not sanctified the, everyone in heaven will hey tim be i got a question sure i got a question with, with that view uh how do the how does the rest restoration view look at like the angelic realm like say fallen angels demons things of that sort yeah, I was I was listening to an unbelievable um, debate. Um, it was um, from two evangelical universalists, and um, and um, they were talking to a, a, a eternal conscious torment guy, and right. they were he was he asked he asked this question, and I totally I totally forget the answer he he brought um, forth, but um, I remember it being like an angle I've never heard before. So I don't want to like I don't I can't hmm. I don't want to like butcher what he said. Um, so I yeah. like I kind of forget what he said, but as of right now, I can't I don't really know exactly like what the like in terms of representing the view, like what exactly they would say and things. Yeah. But what I do know, I'll start with what I do know. What I do know is that um, you you see the language of um, of every knee will bow you know, and things. And either you can, right. you can, you can interpret that as they'll be, they'll forcibly bow like, you know, um, you know. um, like a cop detaining somebody, you know, you know, somebody exercising their authority or that person, or you can see that as no, like God will have conquered sin and death and he will have reconciled everything to himself and every knee will bow. Um, and that's more yeah. of how the uni uh, the universal reconciliation is like looks at those things, um, and so it's like okay, like that's kind of I see it. So if that includes like if that includes Satan, like like okay, you know uh, that isn't that is consistent. That seems very consistent with God's being all power with God being all powerful, and um, that seems consistent with Him being um, all uh, merciful. Um, and this doesn't undermine God's justice because God will, they will pay for what they have done. That's the kind of the thing that it doesn't deny is that, you know, these um, individuals will, you know, pay for the sins of that they've committed. Um, that's like I was saying earlier, like, you know, however, you know, Hitler will have to do that, you know, in his separation from Christ, he will have to do that. Um, but eventually right, right. Um, God will be able to reconcile him through a changed heart. His love will be able to overpower Kind of the same way, like if you think about it, like, you know, people ask, will we have free will in heaven? You know, it's like, well, if we're, if we won't be able to sin in heaven, does that mean we have free will? Well, it's like, no, we will still have free will, but God's love and, and, and his being will be so interconnected and, and it's, and so interpenetrate us that that is no longer a feasible action. 
that we can't, we, we won't, it's just not even something we'll even be able to conceive of, of sinning because we'll be in that kind of capacity. It'll be so, um, it will be so, um, cataclysmic in, in our relationship with God. And so I feel it's, it, it seems, um, coherent enough that when you look at the souls that are, um, that will have to pay for their, pun they'll be punished for their sins that right, right. Um, they'll be able to be reconciled through God's love, still, still, pen uh, still being given to them. And, but you know, since God is just, they're going to have to, you know, um, go through that. So it's so, you know, going to like the Hitler example, it's like, yeah, Hitler, however long that takes, you know, um, unspecified amount of time, um, you know, eventually, you know, he will be, he will bow his knee towards Christ. So Tim, here's a, here's a question I think is, is actually uh, coming towards you. Uh, it says, are there actually from, this is from logical, plausible, probable. Are there actually <laughs> people who claim that Lucifer will be reconciled? Doesn't that directly contradict revelation? Yeah. Um, honestly, I'm going to say I, I, I'm, uh, I'm not sure. Um, I was more just kind of entertaining. Like if you were to take that view, what, what that would look like. Yeah, um, and and also I'm not committed. For, I'm right. not committed either way. Yeah, like that's that's kind of where I'm at. Like okay. I am trying to look at the view as as charitably as possible. Yeah, and, and theologically and, and philosophically. And too logical, just to let you know that we uh we're we're just we discuss many different views here. So you're gonna get a bunch from everybody here. Uh, I think the three up here are definite uh ect guys and the bottom two on your right <laughs> have have got the difference <laughs> <Did you, laughs> <that on> purpose? <laughs> but uh caleb yeah. what's up man uh what did you what do you got yeah so i've got a really really okay. narrow view of hell um for me it's probably somewhere between eternal conscious torment and universal reconciliation so uh that's about as narrow as i get with my view yeah, if I could, real quick, I, I wanted to comment on something that uh, Tim was just saying um, re regarding, like, what we want to find the view that makes God the most loving, essentially. Uh, you know, because as a, a human being myself, uh, who could be going to hell if I weren't, uh, if I weren't, you know, uh, given God's gift of salvation, uh, I have empathy myself, especially for people who are going to hell, uh, and so I, you know, I. I would particularly hope that universalism or even maybe annihilation would be true, but we need to stick with what scripture actually teaches and not go by what we wish is true. And I, I'm not saying Tim is doing that. And I'm not saying, you know, Chris State's going to do that or anything like that. But this is something that some of the annihilationists I know try to do is try to shame people who hold to an eternal conscious torment view as if their view is unloving or unscriptural, uh, things like that. Uh, and, and so we have to be, be careful that we're not uh, taking our own anxieties and fears about hell and and trying to make God unloving if eternal conscious torment were true because of those anxieties. You know, I, I tend to think of, uh, you know, like a parent who tries to, uh, to you know, make the kid, uh, you know, eat her, eat her vegetables or, uh, you know, not, uh, you know, not do something that the kid really wants to do. And the kid uh, still developing and, and learning the way the world works might actually blurt out that that she hates her parents uh when all the parents are really trying to do it is uh, is teach her the correct way to live and and do what's best for her and so you know I, I think we need to be careful not to read our own anxieties and fears about hell uh into our our view of eternal conscious torment or annihilation and say uh because you know for example um you know t god you know uh, torturing someone for eternity would make god unloving or something like that because uh, I, I just don't think it's necessarily i don't think the scriptural truth is necessarily as clear as it should be to start making pronouncements like that yeah I, I yeah so uh, really good um okay. those are really good um um uh, yeah like principles to start by like yeah I would, I would agree with you like um um on those things like hey you know we should we should keep those things in mind we should be careful um yeah i think that's really good and that's honestly how i how what i'm keeping in mind when approaching this but at the, um at the same time it's like you know um what's most you know um i take the approach of you know um you know we should always try to interpret the unclear with the clear and what's clear to me is that um god is love uh he is perfection he's absolute perfection and in 
in the end, if I can't even figure it out, um, I have enough evidence to trust in that, that whatever the end is for, you know, people who have rejected Christ, um, God's decision with what to do with them will in the end be loving. Um, so I always just stand by that in the sense of, okay, what does that look like? Um, but I also think that, you know, we also, you know, being embodied moral agents, um, God created us that way specifically that we have some direct window into what is uh, moral, what is not moral, what is loving, what is not loving. And, you know, I've had people say to me, oh, well, you're only considering this because of emotions. And it's like, well, um, well, it's like, well, emotions can either emotions can be a window into something that's true and it can be a window into something that's false. What if my emotions are a window into something that's true? You know, my emotions, if they're rational, you know, as Aristotle wants us to be, he wants our emotions to, um, if we're acting upon our emotions, they should be rational, rationally placed when, you know, when God in the scriptures is angry, he's angry. He, that's, that's an emotion, but he's angry righteously, rationally. So I, um, that is something that, you know, I, that is something that we shouldn't just discount. You know, these are, these are there for a reason. Emotions are informative things. They're informing something about ourselves, either that. And so, but that gets into a lot of other things. So that's how I look at it. And it's like, you know, yeah. um, that's, so that, that's, that, that, that's how I look at this, this kind of this issue that way. Oh, I, and I yeah, saw, so, um, sorry, real quick, real quick. I saw that same logical, plausible, possible, whatever he said. Uh, he said that I shouldn't be airing opinions unless I've studied eschatology. Um, yeah. It seems like he wants me to, to whatever eschatology he holds to, he wants me to hold that position. Um, yeah, it's like, man, I'm still, it's like, I'm just, why can't I just say I'm researching, bro? Yeah. Like, yeah. You did say that he might've missed it. So you, we got to give him, we got to give everybody the benefit of the doubt. Right. So, uh, Travis, you were about to say something and then I'm going to give it to Dale real quick. And cause I know he had a follow up. So, uh, go ahead, uh, Travis. Yeah. Um, to kind of touch on what everybody was saying, you know, I, I take more of a conditional immortality approach, but, uh, you know, I, I think, we, uh, it's something that I, I try and keep an open mind with. And, um, what I'm really starting to look into is the intertestamental period and like the, the, uh, the, from there. And I think that might could give us a little more insight into this, looking at the intertestamental period and what their view of it was. That's all I have. All right. Uh, you got an answer, Tim. Uh, uh, Dale, go ahead, man. Follow up. Yeah, I had uh, just sort of a, qu uh, a question for the panel, but I know that Kayla, I don't know, has Kayla asked his question? Like, I don't want to be selfish if, if he's got a go question. Ahead, Caleb. I'm just along for the ride. I, I did have a brief follow up or just on Clinton's point, and I appreciate your response, Tim. Um, I appreciate Clinton's uh, passion for avoiding emotions on it too, because I see this with Jehovah's witnesses all the time. One of their primary tactics for trying to pull people in is to say, well, all the other churches in Christendom believe in eternal conscious torment in the Trinity. And both of these things are wrong. So, and they really play on that eternal conscious torment and play it up like, everyone in Christendom believes it except them. So, uh, you know, I, I see how the emotional pull can be dangerous, but Tim's on point too, that, you know, emotions can be valuable as well. So just wanted to throw that in there, but no, I don't have any other topic I'm bringing to the table. I'm just along for the ride. Right on. Um, you know, there's one thing, Dale, before I, I hand it over to you, cause you have a question for the panel. Uh, I would just follow up is, is my own, one of my biggest issues with the whole annihilationist view. Um, you know, they, they put a lot of issues on, or a lot of, um, I don't know, a lot of, I don't even know how to say it right now, but they, they harp on, the eternal conscious torment view about, you know, it violating the nature of God. I, I hear that a lot, you know, God is love and this and that, but uh, I, for me, it's, it's, I think that annihilationists, they, they don't regard sin the way we probably have in the past and how detrimental it is and how corruptive it is. So I think I, there, there could be a pro issue there as well. And that's just what I would follow up with is that, you know, God is holy too, and we don't know how much sin impacts us. I mean, yeah, we 
we have a good idea. We have a little, a little bit of an idea, but I think it goes a lot deeper than, uh, than that too. I, I think it goes a lot deeper than, than that surface level that we have an understanding about. But anyways, Dale, uh, if you want to go to a question, if you guys or anybody want to follow up on that or, or go to another question, that that's fine. I'll, I'll just I, give it to Dale. I wanted to ask something in terms of, you know, I often hear the, um, the argument that, um, infinite sin, I'm oh, sorry. Um, sin against an infinite God requires an infinite punishment. Um, and I, um, I, I think that, uh, that's just an, a non sequitur. Um, but I want to I want to get what you guys how, hear what, what you guys think because um, I grew up hearing that like that was like a philosophical defense of eternal conscious torment. But um, I think it has a lot of holes in it, so I want to hear what you guys think about that. Yeah, I would I would just come back with that with saying I don't I don't think that's enough. I don't think that statement gives you enough. If you want to give somebody an answer that's really certain, like yourself, uh, I would probably try to formulate a answer i wouldn't just give you well you know infinite god uh and you know uh and infinite sin i i i've heard that all too man i i don't think it's a good answer to give to somebody that's actually searching for the answer i think getting into a uh discussion on the theology and sin could be a starting point and it could go from there but, well that brings up an interesting point though uh because we talk about like the passing of time like uh whether it's like e eternal or we're eventually restored, but um, isn't that kind of pre like what's the nature of time in, in the new creation? Because what if like time passes differently where it's not like you've been there five minutes or 5 billion years, you're simply there. I mean, uh, that might be something to look into too. Like what's the nature of time in the new creation? That that's a good point. Uh, I think the um, the in, the finite sin against an infinite God argument. I think that goes back to Jonathan Edwards. Um, but uh, yeah, that I mean, I, I can kind of see where he's coming from on that. But also, I kind of suspect it it equivocates on on the term uh, you know finite and infinite because um, you know the sins that we commit here. Uh, or only temporal, and God is infinite, but committing a temporal sin against an infinite God, I think that that kind of trades on a, on, on different definitions of those words. Uh, I, I'm actually more partial to what William Lane Craig says. Uh, he says that the reason uh, punishment in hell, in hell goes on forever is because when you die, you don't stop sinning, but you continue sinning forever. And so all the sins that you commit in hell uh, will also need to be paid for by your time in hell. And it just kind of stretches on forever. And by contrast, uh, those of us who accept Christ's salvation here on earth, uh, we are preparing ourselves for heaven and uh, for when we will eventually uh, you know, be with God forever with a free will, but also having used the time on earth to prepare ourselves to uh, to abstain from sins. And so uh, that that's kind of, uh, I think that's kind of my preferred way of looking at things. Yeah. You know? All right. Sort of like a soul building theodicy? Uh, I, I suppose so. I've never heard it referred to like that, but yeah. So, Caleb, what, what, you got anything else on that one? All right, Dale. Uh, so yeah, so I I agree with Clinton's. That was going to be sort of my my answer as well. Um, about we keep sinning uh, over eternity in hell, and this accrues more punishment and that sort of thing. That's sort of the option that I think is the most plausible. Um. I think Travis was mentioning about the nature of time, so that that's interesting. So I, I take an A theory of time. I, I don't think time, once time is established, it's going to be the same in both here and in the afterlife in the final state. Um, but yeah, my, my sort of question was sort of following up. So Caleb and, and Tim sort of mentioned the role of emotions. Uh, there might be some more value to them in terms of moral questions. So I just wanted to kind of ask people like, do, do we think that emotions um, are any sort of source of warrant for making moral claims in any way, or are they just totally garbage? And like, I, I sort of came up with my own theory recently. So I don't know if David, do you want me to give, yeah, my give it out? Man. Okay, give it so, out. So let me hear what you guys think. Maybe I'm crazy or something, but yeah. um, so I think that emotion, emotions are obviously linked two moral truths and this this has been proven empirically they, they kind of serve as moral heuristics availability heuristics specifically um so 
this is what what I think that based on my moral ontology, I think that there are higher moral principles or values, you know, things like the principle of justice or principle of truth and that sort of thing. When you violate a moral principle, that's what we call immorality. Um, but there's another type of situation where two or more moral principles will conflict with each other. Um, and we have to make a, a decision on what's best to do. Um, so, so you wouldn't be an absolutist. Um, I, I wouldn't be an unqualified absolutist, I would say. Um, but I, I think that there are exemptions to the moral principles, put it that way. Um, so that's what I think the emotions might be tracking is it's tracking that, you know, the moral ideal has not been upheld. Um, or not. It's not necessarily tracking whether a violation of a moral principle has taken place or not. We, we can't use them to say if, you know, oh, Abraham willing to sacrifice his son, that's, I feel that's repugnant. So that's immoral or something like that. At most, we can just say that the moral ideal is not being upheld based on a negative emotion. So yeah, that's sort of a theory on that show. I don't know if that makes sense, but yeah, what do you guys think and what's your opinion? All right, I'll, I'll give it to whoever wants to tackle it first. Are you talking about our the way our like uh, emotions like uh, like with regard to the nature of God or I don't know if I was following. Um, so your emotions when you're when you're confronted with a moral situation or something, right? So for you know people skeptics will bring up God commanded people to. Uh, kill the Canaanites or something like that, or the hell example, for example, you know, you're going to torture me forever in hell. I, I feel bad emotions towards that. That's repugnant or. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Does, yeah. Does Go ahead. I think it, I think it does. I mean, uh, it, it kind of opens the door for like a skeptical theism too. Like, you know, we don't have a vantage point from eternity, but uh, I do think it, it plays like some, uh, uh, at least, plays a role in how we kind of deal with these kind of topics. Yeah. Uh, Tim, what, what do you think, man? Um, yeah, I mean, um, it's, it's, it, it's, there's not much it's, um, I can really find to really disagree with. Um, but um, what I, how I come at this is, um, we have a multiplicity of senses. Um, and, you know, we have the main senses that we, you know, um, that we are taught that we have. And then we have, I think we have more. I agree with Josh Rassies and that we have more. I think one of those senses is our moral sense. And, um, and it would, it would, it would, it would make no sense to say that one sense, we, we, either all of our senses are a direct window into reality or none of them are. Because it would make no sense that one of my senses actually tells me something correct and my other sense does not. Um, um, when, there is, when there is no relevant difference between them being senses. So um, that's the first part. Um, so I think that, you know, um, by way of uniformity that um, our senses do, are really telling us something. They're telling us something about reality. Um, and, you know, I mean, A.J. Ayer, you know, uh, being a, uh, you know, in the height of logical positivism, you know, viewed moral statements as uh, just a preference, um, as just preference um, descriptions and, and things, and basically us basically uttering our, um, our negative attitude towards something. Like, we don't like racism, uh, that doesn't mean that racism is wrong. It just means that we don't like it. And we're pretty much just shake, raising our fist in the air saying, boo, racism, but that doesn't actually mean anything. Um, so that's like the other extreme you have there. Um, but if, you know, if they do tell us that if you have a window into reality, we have that moral sense, then, you know, when you, when you do see, you know, um, acts of racism happening and you do, you know, have those negative emotions accompanied by it and you understand, um, you know, that is telling you something. Um, and we, but also, we also have to keep in mind that, you know, um, morality is a rational enterprise um, and that, you know, our reason follows it and reason allows us to see, you know, allows us to uncover, you know, 
more about what's right and more about what's wrong. Um, and so yeah. that's why I said in the beginning, like, you know, rationality in conjunction with our emotions is how we should be approaching things. You know, am I having a rational emotion right now or not? You know, um, you know, I, I feel like most people, when they doubt certain things like in, in faith and whatnot, it comes directly from nothing intellectual, but, but majority, but mainly uh, something about, um, you know, their emotional attitude or something like that. And, and human psychology is very, very, very complex. But so I would say that, um, you know, if we're looking, if we're looking at, you know, health and things, and it's like, you know, I, right now I am ex thinking about a, a certain conception of hell, you know, I understand, you know, what it, you know, I'm, I'm seeing this thing about God being loving and things of that sort. And I have experienced God's love and things of that sort, but this doesn't seem to be adding up, you know, and things that's like, I cannot imagine, you know, um, like for example, you know, babies go to hell, you know, um, a, a miscarriage happens. Oh, that sucks. You know, they go to hell, you know, because they have, you know, sin and things or they're guilty for just being conceived and whatnot. It's like, if that makes you, you know, question, okay, my theological views cannot allow, I have to change my theological views somewhere like that. Um, then there is some, there is some credence to that. Um, but if you're to say, if you're, if you are to give credence to something like that, but not give credence to something like, well, just because you don't like the idea of eternal, of an eternal hell, you know, that, that doesn't mean that, you know, that you should change your theological views about it. I would like to know exactly what the relevant difference is between those two. Um, and it's going to lie somewhere in, within our rationality. So that's just going to bolster the point I said earlier, like, uh, and this is what Aristotle taught, you know, um, being one of, you know, um, putting together his great treaties on like moral, uh, on like virtue ethics and things. Um, so, um, exploring these topics, that's completely consistent with, you know, those things. So that's how I look at it. Kind of a winded answer there. Yeah, yeah that was really well said. Yeah. Caleb, what do you got, bud? Oh, I just wanted to join in. So, hi. <laughs> There's two Caleb's. I'm going to say Jackson <laughs> and Johnson. Very similar last name. <laughs> how you doing, Caleb? We have uh, our uh, another guest with us now. It's Caleb Jackson. Uh, he's been on the show. He's no stranger. So yeah, man. Uh, yeah. How you doing, buddy? <laughs> Good. Uh, for some reason, I'm hearing an echo. Uh, everything you're all saying keeps repeating back to me. So I don't know if my audio is messed up or not. Uh, do you have the? Do you? You, are you running the StreamYard along with YouTube in a in the same browser? That could be your problem. Yeah, uh, that happened to me when I first signed on. Yeah. Okay, that's better now. Okay, cool, cool. So, Caleb Johnson, <laughs> uh, uh, from the question Dale asked, uh, what do you got for it? You know, it, it actually raised an interesting thought for me in regards to we have to be careful with how we use terms in this area because senses both play into emotion and emotion plays into how you interpret what you receive from your senses. And particularly when this comes to, to morals, and I was thinking in relation to sin in particular, um, you know, there are people who become numb to sin in a way you have, you know, serial killers. And I think you mentioned uh, the Night Stalker early on the, the episode tonight. And, and so you have those kind of situations. So my thought processes have just drugged me down that road of, of thinking of how how we dull emotions through sin and and essentially can taint our moral moral compass in a way that uh, dulls it or suppresses it uh, and and thus it reflects differently on how we react and and how those emotions come out. So uh, my mind's running circles over in that area. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, Dale. I I don't think you're crazy here, man. I think you got. I think you got it. I, I'd have to uh, confirm what like Tim said. And yeah, man, I, I I can't I can't find any fault in your logic here at all. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks. So I'm not totally crazy then. So that's good. I I like what Caleb was saying too. Like that sort of deals with the. I mean, obviously, appeal to emotion. It's a logical fallacy. How on God's green earth can you be? warranted in, in using them and that sort of thing but um yeah there, there are 
reasons for that, right? There are yeah. distorting effects. Our moods can affect our emotions and our character traits. So that relates to the sinful things. So you've got to be very careful. Yeah. Um, and you have to have good justification, you know? Yeah. You know, I, I think that's important. So, um, Caleb, do you want to talk about anything? You're talking about me or Johnson? Uh, Jackson. <laughs> I, yeah, did, I, I I don't think I heard the question because that was when it was echoing. So. Well, you would be the one starting the next question. Oh. And I, you're going to be the last question because we're on two hours right. and ten minutes. So, Oh, to be honest, I didn't have anything to complain. I just kind of showed up. I was I just got done talking to Tim Batasky and Kyle Vollmer about stuff. So oh, cool. I forgot about joining in here. But yeah. whatever y'all were talking about is – I don't know what the context was, but – I'm sure yeah. it was. It sounded like it was something with hell or sin or something. But uh, oh yeah, we did. We talked about hell a little bit. We talked mm -hmm. about. Uh, we even got bombarded by uh, some presuppositionalism. Oh no, which was fun. But Paulman <laughs> was here for that, so I, I let him uh, talk to his family member there. So okay. he is a presuppositionalist. So. <laughs> I'll watch it later on then. Yeah, yeah. I didn't really have any questions for discussion um it's nice to see dale again right? <laughs> I, don't know. I haven't seen i haven't seen dale since we interviewed lacona so um it's funny because dale actually got me in contact with the guy who's trying to prove uh something i'm trying to get published in the tyndale bulletin right now on resurrection so tony costa yeah yeah he's been helpful so awesome. have you have he has he reached out to you because i know i gave you guys the, the email. yes Oh, that's great. He's look, he's looked over, and I'm just waiting for him to write the uh, the thing on it, so the approval letter. He said he like he would approve. He just has to write the thing. But yeah, no, it's generally good contact. So yeah. uh, I I didn't really have that much questions um, other than just the. I mean, I can say I just published my book on theodicy, and I'm working on other projects right oh, now. But that's not really a question. Oh yeah, no problem. Uh, but you know, balancing mm -hmm. that with school and writing other other projects. Um, I'm doing a book on religious experience, but I'm also like, as a sidetrack, was working on a. Um, I think I'd mentioned this to Dale a little bit during that when on our interview of uh, the visions and dreams of Jesus across multiple cultures that I thought was really interesting. I did a little bit of research into that, and there were a lot of really uh, compelling cases. So I'm trying to make that its own argument in favor of the resurrection. So um, that's been an essay I've been working on as well. So cool. Cool. Yeah. That's interesting stuff, man. <laughs> Thanks. I like your watch. Thank you, sir. This is uh, Walmart top of the line, baby. <laughs> yeah, Walmart <laughs> has stuff that looks nice that's not expensive. Yeah. But hey, man, these things last a long time, though. I gotta, I gotta, mm -hmm. I gotta give it to them. But anyways, yeah, guys. Well, this has been fun. This has been real good. I, I'm glad everybody came on. Everybody like decided to contribute a little bit. This was awesome. This is a, like I said, this is a kickoff to the February month. We've got a lot of stuff coming up. I even had to get myself a calendar. Uh, that's right next to the desk here to uh, cipher through it all. I, I, I want to thank uh, Caleb Jackson, too, for helping me set up, uh, I think, two of the guest host debates. Oh, yeah. And he's working on a third. Were you working on a third one? I set up – no, I think I only set up one, and I'm in the other one. Oh, right? yeah, you're in the other one. I'm yeah, in one awesome. of them, and I'm hosting one of them. I don't remember yeah, what You did bring it. somebody to it, right? I brought Swan, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, awesome. Well, yeah, guys, uh, like I said – look forward to a great month ahead uh, we have epic interviews um and we have great guest uh host debates so uh if you like this type of uh podcast where i could just get anybody and everybody to have an open mic and just talk about anything let me know in the comments and i will arrange another one other than that this is david russell with proselytize or apostatize have a good night thanks a lot david yep, yep. thanks